with you. My name's Bond. James Bond. Bond. James Bond. Bond, what do you think you're doing? Keeping the British hand up, sir. Welcome to James Bond Radio. News, reviews, and discussion of all things 007. Booster. As you can see, I have no problem with female authority. Oh, pipe down, 007. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Hello and welcome to episode 31 of James Bond Radio. My name's Tom Sears and I'm joined by my good buddy Chris Wright. Say hello, Chris. Hello, Chris. How you doing, buddy? You all right? Uh, yeah, I'm all right, man. How are you doing? You good? Very, very well. Did you enjoy our Live and Let Die coverage last time? I did, yeah. It was nice. Um, obviously, getting into Roger territory is a whole new ball game, but it felt, it felt good. You know, we we had a good time with Sean and George, and now we're into a whole new area. But yeah, it's uh, interesting times, good times. It was, it was a wonderful time with Sean and George. We, we we loved every minute of it, but everything has to come to an end. And now now we're, we're, we've moved in with Roger, haven't we, is what we've done. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it, like we said before, it feels like a whole new beginning. It almost feels like we're talking about, because Roger's a different animal to Sean, and George obviously so it almost feels like we're talking about a different subject on some level which is uh, which is always fun to keep it buried it, yeah it does actually you're right but um, equally equally as entertaining I think absolutely so uh, in today's episode we're going to be interviewing the new young Bond author Steve Cole and we're also going to be taking a look at the book as well but what we're going to do is we're going to do it in such a way that because a lot of people haven't read it yet because a it's only been out for a short time um, and b uh, it's not been released in the states yet uh, we know a lot of our listeners won't have had a chance to read it so we're going to talk about the book we're going to kind of review it without kind of giving away too many spoilers so we're going to be talking about the characters the setting um, and all that kind of stuff we're not going to go scene by scene like we do with the movies um, and some of the other book reviews we've talked about um, so if you haven't read the book yet um, don't worry um, but uh, it's even more of an excuse to order it and if you are in the states you can still order it from the UK Amazon and get it shipped over so uh, there is that as well now uh, before we get cracking and, and get into all, all the uh, the bond goodness we have for you this week um, make sure you come and join us on Facebook just put James Bond Radio into the search um, follow us on Twitter which is at James Bond Radio um, and also if you come over to the website jamesbondradio.com uh, you can leave us a voicemail uh, via the button on the right hand side of the page. You can do that through your computer. You don't need to you know, phone it in or anything like that. So if you've got any comments or questions or trivia questions or quotes you want to send over, that's always good fun to listen to. We love um, it all, don't we, Tom? We love we it lo- all. We love it all. Um, and there's a, also a comment system on the website as well. So under any of the blog posts or any of the, the podcast posts, you can uh, you can comment on the episodes and, and get into some discussion there, which is always good fun. And last but not least, uh, make sure you come to our iTunes page and leave us a lovely glowing five star review because that really, really helps us out um, to grow the audience and, and, and grow the show, hopefully. And we've also got a couple of uh, James Bond quizzes. If you haven't had a chance to take you for those yet, we had a uh, our ultimate James Bond quiz and we also had a special bumper christmas edition quiz recently so if you haven't had a chance to uh, to give those a shot then get onto our website and uh, yeah give it a go and test your bondian knowledge absolutely yeah. so uh, so we've got quite a lot of bond news to talk about this week now that's not even specter based bond news we we've got some uh, we've got some other stuff which is equally as exciting in my book um, to talk about this time yeah. the first of which is pinewood uh, have announced that the next Bond event is going to be on September 20th of this year. So if you uh, long-time listeners will know that I went to the, the Living Daylights event last year and it was bloody amazing um, and I can't wait to go back. Um, so this one's happening a little bit later in the year this time around. So it was, uh, I think it was July maybe last year they did it, um, but now it's uh, September 20th. Now, uh, at this point, they have no guests confirmed. Um, they're just kind of putting it out as a save the date type thing. Um, yeah. But the uh, thing to bear in mind that it is there's some big anniversaries this year for for some of the Bond movies. So Thunderball, it's its fiftieth anniversary. Fifty. Uh, I mean, that's that's a massive one, isn't it? Yeah. Fiftieth anniversary for Thunderball. Yeah. And who else have we got as well? So we've got A View to a Kill, which is its thirtieth anniversary. So uh, if they're if they're covering that one, I know Mark O'Connell will be happy with that. The yeah. old uh, Catching Bullets man. And uh, Golden Knight. Now this makes me feel really old. Golden Knight is at its twentieth anniversary this 20- year. Twenty. So, 
years. Oh, 20 no. years for Goldeneye. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, it's, like, it, it's mental. I remember, like, because for me, I always grew up with Bond and always loved it, but Goldeneye was the one that kicked it into overdrive for me. So I remember going in, like, finishing school, walking down to the local cinema and watching it. I saw it seven times, most of which were by myself. And I just, like, I lived and breathed that movie for that year. And to didn't think, you uh, used to comb your hair like Brosnan as well? I did. I did comb my hair like Brosnan and I started to try and act like him and be smooth um it, not very well I might add but there he, he was like the man for me in 1995 I, I just lived and breathed Brosnan and Goldeneye um so to think that that was 20 years ago makes me feel really old yeah. well I mean I'd be if we get Thunderball that'd be amazing if we get Goldeneye that'd be amazing if we get a view to a kill that'd be amazing so yeah. I don't think they might have done a Thunderball one before, maybe. I'm not entirely sure. They, I definitely haven't done a View to a Kill or Golden, I don't think. Yeah. But like, I've, I went to a From Russia with Love one, and that was back in, I think it was 2009, perhaps. So it's quite a while ago now. But when I saw you last year with the Living Daylights one, you're standing next to the double O agents from the pre title sequence. Yeah. I'm like, oh! Wow, that's so good. I was so oh, I was gutted I couldn't make it. But it, it is amazing. Like the the thing with that, I've only ever been to that one last year, but it's so it's it's unlike anything I've ever been to. Like you walk in, and then all the actors and you know the the famous crew that you know have been involved throughout all those years, they're all just milling around in the bar, and you just walk up to them and chat, and you know drink, you know having a beer in your hand and just chatting about Bond. It's really crazy. It's it's so good. It's such a unique event, and I cannot wait for the next one. Um, personally, I'm 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 really hoping for either Thunderball or Goldeneye, but it might not be any of those. I'm just you know we're just speculating that it's a big anniversary year for those movies, so so per- yeah. perhaps they'll be uh, they'll be covering one of those. Cool. And any any Bond film event is going to be good, no matter what it is. But something else that's cool, I mean, obviously with these things, we don't know they'll give us like a date that tickets are going to go on sale, and they go so quick, they're like hotcakes these things. So hopefully, you know, if, if Tom and I get there in time and we get it sorted, then that'd be great. But if there are any JBR listeners who are going to attend or whatever, then it'd be quite cool. We could have a little gathering going and uh, have a catch up and a chat and obviously a drink and, and uh, yeah, just mosey around Pinewood talking about Bond. So that sounds like a pretty good day to me. What do you think? It doesn't get any better. So they, they usually, when they release tickets, they usually give you a good few days notice and it's, you know, tickets will go on sale this Thursday at 9am or whatever and you've, you've just got to be there bang on the nail to, to kind of get any chance of getting a ticket. So um, so we'll let you know as soon as uh, as soon as anything's released and any news comes out about that because we'll definitely be going, providing we can, we're fast enough to get a ticket. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so in other news, uh, which is a really, really interesting one, there's been a Kickstarter campaign to re-record the Moonraker score. Um, now basically there's a, a company, an orchestra called Tadlow Music that have uh, re-recorded loads of uh, John Barry's scores in the past. Um, not Bond ones, uh, you know, other other sort of non-Bond John Barry scores. Um, and uh, Is this their first Bond attempt? I believe it is their uh, yeah. first one. Okay, I might be wrong, right. but this is the first one I, I, it's come to my attention anyway. Yeah. Uh, it's called Tadlow Music. And basically, uh, there's a Kickstarter campaign to get the whole Moonraker score redone. Now, basically, what they, they want to do is record literally every second from the, the opening gun barrel sequence to the closing credits and re-recording those those uh, pieces of music. And just taking some of the text off of the, the Kickstarter campaign itself, um, it says, Why Moonraker? Over the last couple of decades, Moonraker has proved to be the most demanded John Barry and the most frequently requested James Bond score in need of a complete recording. The original master tapes are reportedly lost, which is crazy uh, when you think about it. Ha- who lost them? I mean, like, if you're the... How can you lose soundtrack tapes? I mean, what sort of person or situation means, oh, suddenly they're gone. One day they're there, the next they're not. You know? Some Muppet. Some Muppet has yeah. lost it somewhere along the line. I don't know. But oh. um, yeah, how something as important and historic as that, how does that yeah. get lost? And I it, just don't understand. You know, and if it was the first Bond film, you kind of go, well, they didn't know how important it was. Yeah. You know, Moonraker was solid solid yeah. territory. Uh, the yeah. most successful oh, well. film of that period as well, which yeah, is crazy. of course. Um, so yeah, so while most of uh, Bond's, Barry's Bond scores were recorded in London, were properly archived, Moonraker was recorded in Paris due to contractual obligations. So that's obviously uh, where it fell through the cracks somewhere. Yeah. Um, 
Now, the soundtrack album released in 1979 had a 30-minute program and was missing key moments from the score. The album was, and still is, the only official James Bond soundtrack that didn't feature a single second of the famous James Bond theme. So, obviously, the, the, the theme did appear in the movie, but on the actual soundtrack album that was released, it wasn't featured. Um, that was on one of our... We did a question on that, I think. Uh, I think that was one of your trivia anyway. questions, yeah, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, now, apart from the two major sequences utilising the Bond theme, there are over 10 minutes of other chilling moments missing from the soundtrack, including the iconic gun barrel sequence, the pre tarts hijacking of the Moonraker shuttle, Bond's arrival to Chateau Drax, all the action and suspense music in Venice, and of course the music for the tense race to shoot down Drax's destructive globes. Wow. So that's really interesting, isn't it? Like it's, it's just taking a full movie orchestra and re-recording that score from start to finish. I think that's a great idea and I'm really excited about it. Well, I mean, this is kind of what we've been wanting, isn't it? Obviously, Matthew Grice has got the Fiori's only campaign, which we sort of mentioned about previously. And it just seems silly. It just seems ludicrous that it hasn't been done before, that that we haven't got access to complete full soundtrack versions from all the film. Mm. Um, you know, hopefully this is a step in the right direction. Um, obviously, it's been successful. It's reached its target, so we know it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, there's an audience for it, so you know if this can happen, why not? Why not the others? I know Golden Gun, Spy. There's a lot of others that, you know, there's missing soundtrack music for those as well. Yeah. Um, but with Moonraker, I mean, the opening title sequence, uh, that's got some great music in it, and it just seems strange that uh, you know, it's not there. But it'll be great to hear it. I can't wait. Do you know what? That's one of my favourite moments, like in the skydiving sequence in Moonraker, like. Basically, you know, Bond's not got a parachute and he kind of does all what he has to do to get a parachute. And then there's this moment where, like, it's shot from behind. Jaws kind of swoops into shot behind him just yeah. as, like, the Bond theme sort of kicks in. Kicks in. And I, yeah. I love that orchestration that for that from that sequence. It's, it's cool. a crime that it's not been released, yeah. uh, which is crazy. But, like, it's not like there aren't enough Bond fans in the world to warrant something like that, is there? It's, it's yeah. crazy. Um, now, the, the good thing about this campaign is it's it's actually already reached its target of £25,000. That's how much they needed to, you know, to, the budget to actually rent the studios and pay the musicians and, like, get it to happen. Um, but you can still get involved. And basically, um, there's a load of different prizes you can kind of get for different levels from, you know, just a, like a CD of the of the recordings right up to actually being able to go to the studios and watch them recording wow. the, the whole thing to having your name put in the liner notes as an associate producer and all that kind of stuff. So um, there's, uh, there's some great stuff to be had there so uh, if you head over to kickstarter just type in moonraker into the kickstarter search um, and you'll find the page but uh, but that's really interesting and i'd love to see some more uh, done like that you know with, with yeah. like we say for, for the complete orchestration from the beginning to end um, and if they've done it once with moonraker it can be done again so that's uh, that's Definitely. exciting news we'll look forward um, to it. Yeah, in other news, we, we've uh, got JBR listener Harris Thomas. He's launched a new YouTube channel this week called, called Dressing Like Bond. Um, and he's got a couple of videos up there at the moment, uh, one of which is uh, talking about the, the pea coat that Daniel Craig wore in Skyfall, I think it was. Um, and uh, he's got like a really interesting story about uh, the shop he bought it from and all that kind of stuff and how Daniel kind of stumbled across that coat and he bought it for just for himself as a personal coat and it ended up being in the movie and all that kind of stuff. So oh, that's quite um, cool. Yeah, so if you if you head over to YouTube and type in dressing like Bond into the search, you'll see the channel pop up. Um, and uh, you, make sure make sure you subscribe to that and keep up with Harris's videos. Do you think Harris is ever gonna find uh, James Bond's yellow dressing gown from Live and Let Die with a JB? On well, it? let's set him a challenge, <laughs> Harris. If you're listening, what we want is we want we want Roger's yellow dressing gown. We want um, we want Sean's little terry cloth one piece. Um, what else is there? What else is there? There's got to be some other diamonds I, out I reckon, there. I reckon uh, Roger's knitwear jumper when he's rock climbing in Fiori. Oh yeah, lovely. That's yeah. a beauty. That's yeah. a beauty. Yeah. And, yeah. and of course, you know, you can't go without George's. Uh, um, nice little uh, kilt and accessories, shall we say? Damn right! <laughs> or, the, or that lovely uh, beige suit with the orange roll neck. That's an, that's another oh, great one, isn't it? Yeah, that's a beauty. That's yeah. a beauty. <laughs> um, so yeah, so head on over to YouTube and check that out. Um, now we've also uh, we put out a video a few days ago of our London adventures, didn't we? Last year when we uh, went to as many Bond locations as we could fit in. 
Um, we put that up on YouTube, but we've, we've also put a blog post together with all the directions of where to go and how to find all the locations, which is everywhere from uh, like the, the river from The World Is Not Enough, where Bond's boat sprays the traffic wardens, to, uh, to Bond's little under the bridge kind of garage where he keeps his DB5 in Skyfall. There's the College of Arms as well. That was a great one, wasn't it? The College of Arms. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. a shame because we took loads of photos, but we uh, we didn't take that much video. So the ones in the video were, were just you know one of many locations we visited. But all the instructions are going to be up on the website as well. So come to jamesbondradio.com and check out that blog post and you can uh, follow in Bond's footsteps as well like we did um, and, uh, and see those great locations, which is all good. Um, what else? Last bit of news before we, we talk about the Spectre news. Um, we've put up a new page on the website as well, the About Us page, because we thought it was high time that you and I answered our quick fire 007 <laughs> yeah. questions ourselves, because we always ask every guest and we haven't done it ourselves. So there's yeah. a page where we answer those, um, which you can uh, which you can come and, uh, and pour over uh, our, our thoughts on Bond from best actors to best movies to best books and all that kind of stuff. So come and check out that page as well. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, no, it sounds good. And uh, likewise, if people want to put their sort of answers to the uh, quick fire questions then that'll be quite interesting we get a few you know see what everyone's into and stuff like that that could be quite good absolutely okay so next up we've got our bond 24 speculation section <gasps> speculation I like that. That's great. That's really <laughs> that nice. Right? <laughs> so w- what we've got is basically we've got uh, what we'd call speculation, where we where we sit here and we ponder on what might happen in the next Bond film, right? Um, some of those things might come true. The majority of which I would imagine probably won't come true, but it's fun to talk about regardless. Um, and the other one is potential spoilers, where little bits of news have kind of crept out that we kind of more or less know to be in the film. So for those of you that want to avoid everything what we're going to do is because obviously we won't know how long this section is going to last until we edit it down so what we're going to do is we're going to leave a little gap um where i'm going to overdub the time reference to skip to okay so if you don't want to hear any bond speculation or any spectre news or any potential spoilers i would like you to skip to 25 minutes and three seconds okay so if you're still with us you're coming into the dark side. You're coming into the in through the naughty door to find out the things you perhaps shouldn't know. Um, so kudos to you for that. But uh, so what, what's been going on in the Bond 24 world then this week, Chris? Well, I, well, I think we should just give a quick shout out. Uh, Steve Batchelor, our JBR listener, was the one who, who, who coined the phrase speculation, I believe. So kudos to uh, Steve. Thanks for that one. We'll, uh, we'll keep using that one. Very so nice. looking at the news now, so we're going to... I mean, there's been a lot at the moment about Austria. So we know they're shooting in Austria. It's been going on for a while now. Um, it's got to be wrapping pretty soon. I'm not sure what the what the schedule was, but I think it was maybe three or four weeks, was it? And they've been shooting for a while. So I, I think it's coming towards its end, um, the Austria scene. But there's a couple of things around that which has been quite interesting. Um, basically, uh, people have seen... There's uh, Ben Wishaw, apparently. It's been seen in Austria. Now... Ooh. Now, it could be that he's off on holiday and Eon film happened to be there. Yeah. It could it could be that, you know, he hadn't been skiing for a while. So he thought, oh, where shall I go? I'll go Austria. Yeah. Um, it could be that he's just there to watch production to see how it's going. You know, he's obviously mates with everyone, see how they're doing. Or it could be that Bond is being equipped by Q in the field, uh, i.e. Q goes to Austria and that's where he gives him his stuff. Perhaps the Aston Martin DB10. Who knows? I mean, absolutely. So I suppose it's it could be a number of things because also Christoph Waltz has been in Austria and he's actually said in the press that he's not in any of the scenes. He's just there as a visitor. So it could be the same with Ben Wishaw. He might just be there just to be on set and hanging out and and watching the film get made. Um, But I've got a feeling we're going to see more of this cue meeting Bond in the field. Like we've talked about that before, haven't we? Like you know they'll go into a dark little car park somewhere and Q will be waiting inside an Aston Martin and that's where they'll have the little briefing and stuff. What I would love to see, I would love to see Q's lab in the next one. I would love to see that. I don't know whether we will get it or not, but I'd be excited to see that. Um, But yeah, it's good uh, good to hear that he's he's up and about and and getting involved. Yeah, definitely. Um, Now, another thing along the sort of Austria side of things, we've had a still of Bond. Now, 
whether this was released by Eon or or whether it had been captured and been released, basically it's kind of flooded the internet. So I'm assuming that everyone has seen it. Obviously, everyone that stayed on to listen will have probably seen it. Now, this is a picture of Bond striking a pose on snow, holding a gun out, wearing clothes very similar to Lazenby at the end of Majesties, I might add. Very similar looking sort of uh, outfit. That Would, he's got do you know what my initial thought was? He's yeah. wearing Roger's outfit from the climax of Live and Let Die. He's got the black oh, roll okay. neck on, the black trousers, you know, yeah. with if he had a brown shoulder holster on, it would have been the Ooh. look. And, so, and we know how much Mendes loves Live and Let Die. As does Daniel, yeah, absolutely. As does Daniel, yeah. So they, they'll both try and get all of Live and Let Die in. Yeah, I suppose it's kind of a bit of a mix of the two because obviously you've got the snow, the majesties and that sort of thing. And, mm. and there's pictures of George holding a gun in the snow and it's quite similar. Yeah. But then, like you said, yeah, the, the black sort of... Uh, almost commando like outfit isn't it mm. um so yeah so obviously now we know it's going to be an action scene in austria some people are suggesting it's a pre-credits maybe it is maybe it isn't but you know there's i think there's going to be a big big set piece with this particular location you know there's yeah. been a lot of time there and uh it'll be interesting to see how it goes as to what it might be again who knows but yeah it'll be an interesting one to see how it goes i think Absolutely, yeah, it's exciting. It's it's kind of basically the poses. He's in the middle of a street, pointing a gun. There's kind of like there's like a plane. It looks almost like a helicopter, but it's a light aircraft that's crashed nearby with flames coming off of it. Um, which was the very first plot spoiler rumor that we heard way back in the day, wasn't it? That there was going to be a plane crash involved in Austria. So there it is. Yeah. Um, so quite what happens in that sequence, I don't know. But we do know Dave Batista's out there as well, don't we? So perhaps he, that's his first face-off with uh, yeah. with old Mr. Hinks. And Leah Sado is out there as well, isn't she? Indeed so, she is. And is Monica there as well? I don't know. Maybe the I whole think she is. is yeah, I think yeah, perhaps, so there we go. perhaps we're talking shit. I, I, They're I, all there, yeah. It's only, yeah, it's only a one-scene It's only a one scene film now. Yeah. Everything is going to be in this one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. Um, so, yeah, so we've got that to uh, to look forward to when that comes out. Um, now, there are, have been a couple of other little potential rumours that have been quite strong, actually. In fact, there's one that we think are pretty is pretty much certain from what we've seen, and that is that for the first time since Live and Let Die, we're going to see James Bond's London apartment. Now, what do you think about that, Tom? I'm really excited about that. I don't think we see it enough. Um, now... What is exciting to me is that remember when we did our little location tour and we actually went, basically some fans somewhere along the line have pinpointed the fact of where Bond's apartment would have been um, in yeah. Chelsea, just off the King's Road. Um, and we actually went there, didn't we, and stood outside the front we, door we and all didn't, that kind of stuff. Uh, I didn't get the, we didn't get the photos from that, or did we take photos there? I, we, think we I think we have, yeah, I think we have. I'll have to dig yeah. them out. But uh, but yeah, the, yeah. that's the, and I've actually seen a still of Daniel in his dressing gown in his bathrobe, it's not bright yellow, sadly. Um, looking out the window of the apartment, and it does look very much like that street we went to. So wow. I'm not sure, but maybe they actually used that very location wow. to do this, do the filming. And do, do we remember the name of the street? In uh, Chelsea? Do you know what? I can't remember it off the top of my head. But Was yeah, it something we'll, Muse or something? I can't remember. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll get there. It'll be in the blog post anyway, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we'll uh, get there. check that out and you'll you'll see yeah. it. But yeah, I'm I'm happy to see Bond's apartment. I wonder if he's still yeah. got the same decor that he had in Live and Let Die. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hopefully it's been sl- updated for uh, for a little bit. But yeah, so that'll be like Live and Let Die. Uh, obviously, Doctor No was the first time, and and now Spectre. So yeah, that that's kind of like an interesting one. Um, okay, so. And and you, you, do you remember they released it still with the Spectre sort of clapperboard and the ball? Yeah. Dog? Now, apparently, that was from the scene in his apartment. Uh-huh. So that desk and the dog, he's obviously kept from Skyfall in his home. And, and you know, and that's kind of like a link to it. So, yeah, so that, that'll be interesting to see, uh, Very nice. to see how that comes out. Um, so kind of following on from that, actually, um, there's obviously going to be some part of a continuation story from Skyfall. We've got the, the dog is obviously the main link. Uh, you know, we've mentioned before the possibility about M sort of di- giving a last sort of a mission to Bond posthumously. Um, uh, and and remember, we heard that there was some sort of political unrest within MI6. Those, mm. those That's been sort of said as part of the premise. So it could be the fact that whatever M, however she, Judy Dench's M, manages to communicate with Bond, there must be a way that she does it, whether it's through the Bulldog or whatever else. I th- I think she's going to have to hint that okay something isn't right M- MI6 
I'm not here anymore. You're going to have to deal with it. And and potentially that could bring Denby into play. We know he's obviously an MI6 person. It could be someone else completely. But I think, obviously, Spectre is, is we mentioned before, it's it could be sort of something dangerous like an organisation, but there's also a ghost side to it. So I I think this is where we might get a bit of Judy Dench here. Not that we're obviously going to see her spectral ghost or anything like that, but it's almost the ghost of whatever she's leaving to Bond is oh, going to influence a film. And that's I, and I an think, interesting angle. Yeah. yeah, that that's where I think this that sort of part might come from. That's yeah, the I spectre think, think of the previous M coming back to guide James forth against his fight against Spectre, Spectre. the organization. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There Very we go. nice. Absolutely. We'll have to see, but that's a, that was an interesting one. Um, yeah. so yeah. Um, so that's kind of where, where we're at with, uh, with our speculation for today. So, uh, okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to play, we're going to play a little trick on the listeners who skipped forward and skipped the spoiler section, right? I'm going to give them a time reference and then we're going to pretend that there's a massive spoiler that, they, that they've skipped to the wrong bit and there's going to be a massive <laughs> spoiler. So let's do it. Right. Okay. okay let's here we do go. it. Okay. <clears throat> Man, I can't believe he's going to die at the end of the film. Like, how can you just kill off James Bond like that? I, I, well, do you remember, though, Fleming did it in From Russia With Love and everyone's like, oh, you can't do it. But he brought it back. He was weak. He all know this is the last Bond film that there's ever going to be. They they want to go out on a high. They don't yeah. want to go out when it's low. Bond is, is massive. The, the only way that they can do it is for Bl- Bond to be killed by Blofeld and blow felt to rule the world, and that's yeah, it, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, that's the end of our spoiler section. I mean, I, I, think I hope no one heard that, by the way. Yeah, no, absolutely. Just kidding. Not really. Oh! We were just winding you up. That's not really going to happen, <laughs> as far as we know. It might do. I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, actually, yeah. hopefully not. But there we go. Just winding you <laughs> yeah. up. It's all good. You're, you're in spoiler-free zone from here on out, so don't worry. It's all good. Spectre wipe, is, wipe the sweat off the forehead. Indeed, indeed. So you're all good. So uh, what else have we got? We've got some. Uh, we've got a really cool speak pipe message. Now this listener um, phoned in, or, or speak piped in, I should say, recently, uh, Mr. Jed Yong from uh, Singapore. Singapore. Um, now this one is a great question, and there's a, an unexpected performance that comes out of nowhere, which really, really put a smile on my face as well. So let's play Jed's message, and then we'll have a chat about it. Hi, Tom, Chris, and fellow JBR listeners. This is Jed Yong from Singapore again. I'm almost caught up with all the episodes since I started listening about two to three weeks ago and have really been enjoying myself. Your enthusiasm with regards to Spectre in particular is really infectious. I've been having so much fun. So I want to cast your minds back to the soundtracks of Bond episode in which you discuss John Barry's 007 theme. While it's uh, exuberant and driving, it might perhaps be a little bit out of place in a more serious Daniel Craig era Bond film. So I was wondering, would it work if transposed into a minor key? Perhaps something like this. Let me know if you think that works. And have a spectrific 2015, everyone. Goodbye. Okay, so what do you think about that? Bringing back the 007 theme in a minor key. What do you think? Wow. Well, I certainly haven't heard anything like that before, but um, yeah, I'm game for it. It sounded sounded interesting. I mean, nice little classical sort of style to it. Uh, yeah. Why not? I'm, I'm not sure how, I suppose, in terms of the scene where it might be used. Obviously, you're kind of thinking a slow, perhaps romantic scene. Yeah. Um, could be with a... Uh, you know, Lucia Sciarra sitting on his lap or... Do you know what I was thinking? Once I heard that, I was like, do you know what? I could actually see that working. And I, here would be my imagination of, of it. It wouldn't be an action sequence. I think you'd have to cut out the... Because that's the bit for me that actually dates it the most, right? Yeah, yeah. And that main melody that Jed played there, I think if you slowed it down and kind of almost incorporated it into like one of those establishing shots. Do you know what I mean? So it's like yeah. a shot, like you remember the shot at the opening of like uh, Quantum of Solace where you're out across the water or something, yes. or, or one yeah. of those, like a shot like that with with kind of like a chilled out version yeah. of it, like or just a little homage to the 007 theme. Yeah. I think it would be really nice. I think that works yeah. without sounding dated and out of place. Yeah. I mean, 
you could you could do that in in a modern Bond in Spectre or Bond twenty five, and and again it'll be a nice little nod, wouldn't it? Yeah, Very yeah, nice. absolutely. Like maybe well, so. Maybe maybe Jed's onto something there. Yeah, maybe. Well, uh, hopefully he can get in touch with Eon and see what they say. You never know. You never know. <laughs> yeah. um, but on on the sort of same sort of line, really, along the music line, we also received a, a, a message from a Finnish JBR listener, Erky Samuel who sent us a rather interesting YouTube clip of a Finnish singer called Heidi Kiru. Um, I think that's how her name is pronounced. You've got to forgive and us she, if, they, if our pronunciations yeah. are off there, because, you know. I think, I think they're bound to be off, so yeah. apologies there. <laughs> but yeah, so Heidi has sung a song called James Bond. And, uh, and it was interesting to listen to. And also the music video was really good as well. Mm. Um, so yeah, if, if anyone wants to sort of check this out, we'll stick it on the Facebook page. You can have a look and have a listen. And yeah, it was an interesting thing. What did you think of that one, Tom? Yeah, it's funny. It's, uh, it's, I like any, any kind of homage to Bond in whatever form it comes in. So it was, it was fun. Um, obviously like the lyrics are actually in Finnish as well. So it's kind of, uh, it's, it's interesting to kind of hear, um, as an, as a non-Finnish speaker, I don't know, do you, do you speak Finn? Uh, only on Tuesdays. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> there my, that's my finish day. Maybe. So <laughs> there you go. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's a fun listening and a good video as well. So uh, keeping the the Finnish Bond contingent alive. Um, yeah. I'm not going to try and pronounce any of those names because I'll just fall <laughs> flat on my ass. So uh, what else have we had? Any emails from listeners this yeah. week? Uh, yeah, we have actually. We've had a great email uh, from uh, Gary Smith, JBR listener Gary Smith. Now, I'll just read this out to you because I think it is, it's really nice. And it's one of these messages that we love to hear. Y- you know, every Bond fan loves to hear because, well, I'll read it out and then we can ch- talk a bit about it. So this is from Gary Smith. Okay. He says, hi, Chris and Tom. I'm a bit late coming to the JBR, but I've been watching and catching up on your YouTube channel and enjoying your podcasts. Um, I love your enthusiasm for all things Bond and your reactions and comments make me laugh. Just a quick story. This weekend, my son, who's six years old, finished his homework and it was cold and damp outside. So as I've been watching your videos, I thought we could watch a Bond film. I had to think about which one he could watch and decided that a good Roger Moore would be okay. So I put on The Spy Who Loved Me. Good choice. And then when I put the film on, my four-year-old came in and asked what we were watching. He normally has the attention span of a goldfish, so I thought he wouldn't stay for long. OMG, they both loved it. (laughs) Each gasps when they saw the approaching cliff at the beginning and and asked how he was going to survive. Both were completely scared of Jaws. The six-year-old loved the tanker eating the submarine. I could go on. They obviously really, really enjoyed it. Mm. Now, at the end of the film, it was a thumbs up from both of them. And as an extra bonus... As I gave them their dinner, I turned on the TV in the kitchen. Lo and behold, Live and Let Die was playing on the TV. Very nice. Just as they got to the point with the crocodile escape and the boat chase. So, you know, that's good timing there. Nice. Um, Both sat glued to the screen, not eating much of their dinner. I think we may have found some new James Bond fans. Keep it up, guys. I'm already looking forward to the next podcast, Gary. Oh, now oh, I love that sort of stuff. Yeah. There's nothing that, like, you know, there's nothing that excites me more than seeing a young kid getting into Bond in a big way and loving it. Because I remember being like that when I was a kid, and it's good to see it carry on. I love it. Yeah, I think it's got it. You know, Bond is going to surpass us. We know that Bond. You know, we're going to be gone before. You know, Bond is going to continue. Ad infinitum, I think. Mm, yeah. Um, but obviously, for that to happen, this these are the sort of people that we need to uh, to be coming forward and 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 encourage. And you know, it's great to hear. Absolutely. Excellent. I, well done. I, Good job, Gary. <laughs> I would say Spy Who Loved Me is probably the the best film for kids of that age, isn't it? To, to introduce. I would agree, to. actually. Yeah. Because yeah. it's it's fun. It's quite light hearted, but you still got you got Jaws. You got some good action elements. You know, it, it's it's yeah, it's a perfect one I think for that sort yeah. of age group. In fact, if someone had said, "Okay, Bond film for a six year old," that would pretty much be my first choice. I think. Yeah, you wouldn't want to give yeah. them license to kill, would you? N- probably not. No, or Quantum of <laughs> Solace might be a little nah. bit as well. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, good choice. Well done. Well, there we so go. Stuff. So moving on, we it's time for some Bond trivia. Bond and I, I've I've learned something today in my Bond trivia research. I've learned something that I didn't know before. So I'm wondering whether wow. I'm going to catch you out today as well. Well, I think you probably will. In that yeah, case. well, there we go. So uh, I'm going to go first this time. And my Uh-oh. Bond <laughs> trivia question of the day is. Yes. Which Bond girl 
from uh, You Only Live Twice, yeah. also appears in another Bond film as a different character. And what was that other Bond film? Ooh. Now, does that ring any bells with you at all? Do you know what? It didn't for about five seconds, and then a light went, and then I kind of got a little something hinting. So, so okay. I'm gonna have to have a really good think about that one. All right, very nice. There's something. Um, it's it's close. Put it that right. way. Hope, cool. Well, hopefully it's close. Hopefully it's close. Okay, so my Bond trivia as well. Um, now, obviously, we're talking a bit about Young Bond today with Shoot to Kill. So my Bond trivia question is: In which Young Bond novel? Does James Bond join the Danger Society? Oh, that is a good one. Yeah, okay. So which young Bond novel did James Bond join the Danger Society? Now, when I, if I had been that age, I would have loved to have joined a Danger Society. Mm. I would have been on that like a rocket. I would have been, yeah, let's go for it. Let's, yeah. you know, let's just get into dangerous mischief and adventures and stuff. I mean, that, that sounds like a pretty cool gang to be a part of. Damn right, yeah. I'm gonna. It's been. When, when did I read the Young Bonds? I, I must have read the Young Bonds probably three years ago. I would say, and I, I just raced through the whole lot of them because I loved them so much. They're great. Um, great. So great. yeah, I think I've got an idea, but we'll uh, we'll obviously reveal the answers to those trivia questions towards the end of today's episode. So uh, you've got some time to think about it. So uh, before we talk about the book, we're going to uh, we're going to cut to our interview with Steve now. Um, Steve Cole, the the new Young Bond author, who's taken over from Charlie Hickson. Um, he was good enough to grant us some time. Um, I know he's really uh, up against it with deadlines for new books, and he's yeah. just delivered Young Bond book two um, as well. So he was he's been really busy, but he was really kind enough to give us some time. So um, we just like to thank Steve before we uh, we play the interview. Um, and in sort of typical fashion with Bond fans, he had a lot to say and a lot to talk about. So it, it turned out as a really good interview, didn't it? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. He's a top bloke, and you know. Obviously, a really, really strong uh, Bond fan, and yeah, he had a lot of good stuff to say. So yeah, let's uh, let's play the interview. Cool. So here is our interview with young Bond author Steve Cole. Okay, so Steve Cole, welcome to James Bond Radio. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Good to be here. Good stuff. Now, uh, what we always do is we start off our guest interviews with some uh, quick fire Bond questions, just to give all of our listeners a, a good idea of uh, where you're coming from with your James Bond fandom and your, your relationship with Bond. So I'm going to start off by asking you, what is your favourite Bond film? Favourite Bond film? Oh, it changes regularly, but um, <laughs> I guess... On Her Majesty's Secret Service and Live and Let Die are probably two of my face right now. Oh, wow. nice. How, Great. How apt is that? For, Tom and I both love Majesties. We reviewed it recently and it's probably our favourite at the moment. And funny mm. enough, we just recently reviewed uh, Live and Let Die. So you're right on, right on the money there, I think. <laughs> Great. Um, so going on to question two, what would you say is your favourite Bond book? Favourite Bond book? Probably Majesties again. Uh, that's a big, big, a uh, big love for that. Um, Are you again, into skiing yourself? I'm not into skiing myself. No, I think this, as soon as I put on a pair of skis, I think my arms would just break. Just you know, <laughs> even without falling over, I think I'd just you know <laughs> they would just crack, um, and I'd be, I'd be unable to work for months. So uh, no, I've not uh, I've not taken that risk. But I always think, wow, I'd quite like the acro ski stuff. I think that would be that'd be quite cool. One of the things on my to do list. But, um, probably I don't have any, any desperate deadlines coming up. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what do you think it is about Majesties you like so much? Is it the uh, is it because it's got the whole emotional arc with the with the wedding and all that kind of stuff? Or Yeah, I just think it's one of those ones that just sort of grabs you, you know, right the way through when you're intrigued and you're seeing you know, going into the water and then it's bonded straight away and in danger and then we kind of redo the bit flashbacks and the flash forwards and the whole thing with the uh, the the storyline is is slightly bonkers in terms of uh, the plan but what, I, you mean I, 12 angels is death what's bonkers about that <laughs> all plotting all plotting death against hens and stuff, you know? <laughs> i mean i but you know i, I kind of like the, the the sci-fi angle of that you know it's not beyond the bounds of of possibility but it just it just pushes the envelope a bit in the same way i love the giant squid at the end of dr no that that it's like what are they going to pull out next it's like oh, okay massive giant squid you know it's it's one of those things that it gets, <laughs> It kind of elevates it from uh, from your usual spy thing. I don't know. It makes it somehow it, it, it heightens and focuses uh, the the feelings of uh, adventure. And I just love you know the disorientation 
post bobsleigh you know in, in the village when tracy takes him to safety and everything so it's it's kind of it's it's just cool i think really so that's probably one of the reasons i like it and yeah it's got the, the killer the killer end that you just think yeah that's just that's a nice satisfying um, emotional roller coaster to be taken on so uh, yeah the action and, uh, and the whole thing anyway that wasn't very quick far was it sorry oh, about that. no worries <laughs> you, can, right. you can feel free to go in depth if you like it's uh, we, we, we're always up for talking about majesties that's for sure um, okay so next question is who is your favorite bond girl um <laughs> i want to say diana Rue, but this is going to seem a bit one note isn't it um so um on a black one obviously is uh it's fantastic I've always been into the Avengers as well, see. So it's always been that little, you know, when when they kind of crop up in something like Bond, that's that's cool. Um, yeah. But um, then again, Jane Seymour, fantastic. Um, yeah. Very nice. We spoke at length about Jane Seymour during the uh, Live and Let Die review we're releasing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was lovely. It went down well. I was reading uh, Roger Moore's account of, uh, of of the filming of that. You know, the uh, the little paperback. Yeah, the diary yeah. he kept, yeah. Yeah, diary, yeah. And, That's a brilliant uh, book, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Just fantastic. I love that. I just love the, um, just the, so many good anecdotes in there. And just gives you such a real flavour of the making of it. Um, and then, um, yeah, it's good to see that, that Roger was you know, enjoying his love scenes quite as much as he <laughs> yeah. Some people act all very modest about it, don't they? And say, oh, well, it's, not, yeah. it's really his hard work. He's just saying, yeah, let's bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I was liking that. It's very much like his on-screen personality. It does seem to come across like that, doesn't it? It just um, yeah. that, that, that dry, that dry sense of humour that comes on. Um, so, yeah, very entertaining. So here's a, an interesting question. Then, who is your favourite James Bond actor? Well, um, again, it's, it's it's kind of all the different ones have different strengths. I honestly do enjoy them all, but um, you know, Roger Moore was the one that I grew up with. Although he's the least Fleming, um, he'll always have. You know, uh, that safari suit will always have a big spot in my infection. <laughs> so, those are, that was, you know, my first cinematic experience of of Bond was, um, you know, actually oh, going to the cinema to watch one was for your eyes only. Um, oh, wow. Which, uh, when I was about nine or ten, um, and uh, my mum was a huge Roger Moore fan, so I guess that, that maybe you know, rubbed off on, on me. I remember buying her the uh, the Christopher Wood novelization of Moonraker for her birthday one time because it was, I found it cheap in, a, <laughs> in Smith's. <laughs> yeah, it was a bargain thing. And uh, it's like James Bond in a, in a space suit. And I thought, I thought he was a spy. What's he doing in a space suit? You know, so I found it, you know, post Star Wars. And everything. that was very exciting, but also very baffling for a young boy. Um, and then like Fury Eyes Only came along and it was like the absolute opposite of, <laughs> of everything in the movie. Yeah. And it was, it was all, I was quite happy with this whole Bond thing. I was allowed to uh, stay up and watch them as a, as a special treat. And Man, Man with the Golden Gun we had on video, when it was shown about 81, 82. Um, wow. So that was one that I, that I got into very, very uh, quite early on so yeah so while i enjoy them all uh, and i can watch i can watch a, a roger moore bond movie and just you know remember what it was like those, those first thrills as being a kid you know um, when i used to play in the playgrounds so i guess I'll, I'll always i'll always have that but then you know equally it was even though it was through the movies i came to to bond it was from um I think it was A View to a Kill, which I you know, massively enjoyed at the cinema again, and I wanted to find out what, what the books were like. And I was, you know, there wasn't a, you know, I couldn't find a novelization. And I thought, well, I found it in this book of short stories. And I realized, of course, there's actually you know, very, very little relation between the uh, short story and the film, you know, apart from you know, Paris turning up. Um, yeah. And I was so, so intrigued by just how different it was in terms of you know, the somber mood and getting inside Bond's head and. You know, the whole thing of him just sitting in, in the bar and feeling very world-weary. Um, it was just like one of those moments where you're just thinking, wow, this is just, this is like Bond on another level, you know. And so that made me want to see what the differences were between, you know, the movies and the books. So I'd assume that they were they were fairly closely, you know, adapted. Mm. I think was, quite uh, a few people do, really, wouldn't they? I think quite a few people who maybe see the movies but don't read the books would automatically think, oh, it's just a copy, carbon copy. But uh, obviously yeah, that's that, not the judge, case. Judge, yeah, it's just a literary bond on the uh, on the film <laughs> bonds uh, persona as well. I think um, in terms of some of the reactions you get. So yeah, that was that just led to me, you know, every every Saturday you know, going down the Bedford Central Library and and working my way through their hard covers of uh, of the Fleming Bond novels, um, which was a whole different way to enjoy them because you know, we had most of them on video by then, um, just taped off the telly. Um, it, it was interesting then to sort of go back and get an appreciation for the different eras of it really. Um, Obviously, it was. I was. Uh, I was. I think I was slightly resistant to the, 
the Dalton one coming in. I, um, it was quite, it seemed quite different and you had that, you know, that was, so that, and then I enjoyed like to kill rather more because that seemed you know, darker and, and, and bigger. And I was, you know, in my late teens by then. And, and I think it sort of struck that chord in me about, yeah, this is much more serious now than those, you know, those, <laughs> those my hearted ones. This is like proper, proper, you know, um, and then you know, it was, it was gone. And I remember, you know, feeling quite, you know, well, it was, there was something missing, you know, and then of course, I came back with Brosnan. It was like, I remember watching that in the cinema. And then I think it was a bit when the tank comes bursting through the wall and the <laughs> bomb thing crashes in. It was like one of those, and it got this massive thrill right through the rib cage. You know? <laughs> Sorry, one of those, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's back. It's back. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting to, you know, to, to look back and realize, you know, it was, it was a, you know, a, a proper part of, of my life. And along with other, you know, a lot of sci-fi genre stuff that I was into like Doctor Who and, and uh, things like that. Um, but, but Bond was always there. Absolutely. Now, I think you, you might have already answered this next question, but uh, the next question was, what is your earliest memory of Bond? So would that be for your eyes only? Um, no, that was, that was the earliest cinema experience. But I guess the, um, it, it must be watching one of, the, one of the early ones because I had the uh, Corgi Goldfinger Aston Martin with oh, all the very uh, nice. gadgets. Yeah, it's still around. Some of it's scratched. Um, but, it's, uh, but yeah, the ejector seat and the bulletproof thing. I love playing with that thing. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was. So obviously, I must have been very aware of, of Bond to, to have had that, or at least my, my dad was, and he wanted to kind of like you know, foist it onto me, and you know, in that way that we encourage artists to uh, share the things we like. Um, so that playing with that would be my earliest earliest memory of it. And then um, I must have seen some of the Conneries before. The Roger ones, but it was the Roger ones that stuck in my mind. So um, yeah, it's probably um, it's probably Bond in a spacesuit and the TV Times running a, you know, doing a big poster of Roger Moore wearing this spacesuit and, and the incongruity of that. Yeah. Just thinking, it's quite a memorable <laughs> image. That <laughs> <laughs> it is, isn't it? It is. Um, and are your mum and dad still Bond fans to this day? Um, they they still watch the movies. Yeah, they. I think yeah. uh, once. I think you know, my mum also liked Pierce Brosnan, actually. She's always, I think she's always fancied James Bond generally <laughs> in various form. Um, I think I'm sorry, you're a little bit old from now, Mum. Um, but, uh, although, how old is Bond? I mean, <laughs> well, that's it, yeah. That's it, yeah He's still 38, isn't he, or something? <laughs> yeah, that's a deal. Um, so, yeah, I guess um, they, they still enjoy it. My, my, dad, uh, my dad read Shoot to Kill um, recently, and um, he doesn't, you know, he hasn't you know, read. He reads my older books, but um, that was one that he enjoyed getting to grips with. I think for its uh, its Bond flavour. So, yeah. Did I think, he give yeah, you? Um, did he give you any critique feedback on it? He, he did. He did try to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as as per really yeah my my, my dad's always uh, always been there he was always always thinks that he can kind of like enhance things you know so uh, and I I try and you know, sort of like grit my teeth and <laughs> think you think so dad okay well I'll bear that in mind for the next one um, so yeah that's uh, that's that's quite fun though it's nice to have uh, have the family uh, you know, interacting with that and so yeah him and my uh, my son my ten year old son is uh, starting to read it now as well so uh, I shall look forward to uh, his his opinion too I hope yeah yeah. yeah. Fingers crossed, but I'm sure you'll love it. <laughs> um, so here's another interesting one. Sort of look, going back to the films. Now, if you could visit any Bond location from the films which you haven't already visited, what location would that be? Oh, I think I'd like to go to Thailand for the um, the Man with the Golden Gun setting. I saw a friend went at a oh. at New Year and recreated the uh, the duel on the beach scene with the uh, the friend he was with. I looked at that and thought, oh, swines. <laughs> you know what? I, I was there just last month. Really? You were there yeah. last month? Oh, gosh. It's, and is it, it looks exactly the same from the picture. Is it still? Yeah, it's, it's identical. I, I shot a little video around the, the, the island. I'll send it to you. It's tiny, but it looks more or less identical. The only difference is, is there's a lot of uh, little kind of shacks and stalls selling kind of souvenirs and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> which, you, which you would expect. But other than that, it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's exactly it still called the same. James Bond Island or whatever, it, is it? It is indeed, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. That's no, so I was, cool. Yeah, I was, I was invited to go to a, a, a literary festival in Hong Kong, um, uh, which I should have gone to in March, but I couldn't because I'm actually going to uh, another one at Clash. But again, I was thinking it would be, it'd be good to um, to sort of like take in that, that side of uh, <laughs> of the Bond sites yeah. as well, the Hong Kong thing. So basically now I'm always still planning in my head, where can I go that I can you know, <laughs> have a little experience like that. But yeah, I'll, I'll be interested to hear what you thought about you know, the Bond Island thing because it's been one of those things where it just looks so stunning. 
yeah as a location yeah without uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely send you the video you can you can take a look excellent um, excellent cool so uh second to last quick fire question is what is your favorite scene in the series favorite scene? In, the, in, the, in the, the film series in the film series yeah um so many how'd you boil it down I mean um, it's a tricky one isn't it <laughs> it's a tricky one isn't it I mean yeah most of Casino Royale uh, I don't have to say um, the, the torture scene in that is, is pretty intense um, yeah. maybe um, the the, kind of the the tanker chase and destruction in uh, License to Kill yeah, is a good. pretty yeah. pretty arresting climax um, then um, I've always got a soft spot for the um Man of the Golden Gun showdown, even though you can see Roger wobbling as he's uh, standing on the, <laughs> the podium. I do like the way he's kind of like got his fingers down, so it looks like he's got the shot off fingers. That's always it's good. I think it's a nice, uh, nice fitting end to uh, to that one. Um, the, the ones where he's using his intelligence as well as his his brawn, I think, uh, are the, the moments that's all I like, catch you the most. And think, yeah, brilliant. That's why that's why no no one does him better. Does it better? Yeah. Obviously, the um, the ski sequence at the uh, the top of uh, Spy Who Loved Me, um, uh, fantastic moment um you know i could i could keep keep going on <laughs> i think that's probably an impossible question isn't it yeah it, it is really it is um too many to mention even your favorite scene from each film would be tricky because there's so many right well, um, it, it goes on a bit doesn't it yeah definitely so last quick fire question now this is a, a, a kind of a strange one but what do you think is the most bondian thing you've ever done <sighs> most bondian thing i've ever done goodness <laughs> Um, Without getting too rude now. Yeah, just <laughs> <laughs> leave my watch out. Um, oh, let me have a think. Well, I mean, when I when I heard the news that I was um, I was going to be writing Shoot to Kill, I was in a nice hotel room in New York, looking out over Central Park. You know, sort of like just just rising in the morning and uh, getting this email come through. That had a, a fairly pleasing. Bondian vibe to it as I was able to go downstairs and have some you know, coffee and scrambled egg and like you know privately oh, I wasn't allowed to tell anyone that what had happened it's top secret but I just had this little kind of wow going on there because it uh, so that was that was quite cool I suppose um, how long how long did you have to keep it a secret how how long before you were allowed to sort of reveal what what was the timeline oh it, it felt like forever you know um, that must have been so it, tricky it was it was tricky yeah it was. Um, I think December 2012, I was um, first contacted and, uh, and asked about it. And so January 2013, I started putting you know, my thoughts together and started um, discussing it with um, Fleming Publications. And then uh, there was a bit of tune and fro, and I met uh, the, the Fleming Estate in around about March time, I think. Um, and did some redrafting in you know, just taking all their comments. So it was kind of like going on and it was still, you know, will I do it? Won't, won't I do it? Um, and then I think it was around about April, I was, I was told, or early May, I was told that I had got the gig and um, it was time to proceed with the writing of it. Um, and then I, uh, it wasn't announced until the start of October. So I had that entire wow. time. I wasn't able to, um, and, you know, I always hate it on things like, you know, on social media when someone says, I've got some amazing news, but I can't tell you anything about it. After <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that just annoys me. So I didn't do that. I didn't have a little kind of like, you know, a, a silent gloat or anything like that. I just, uh, so I just kept it all, all to myself. I'm kind of slightly paranoid about it getting out. So over the summer, I just told people I was, I was working on a historical novel, which I was. Um, and yeah. luckily I didn't ask too much about it. And uh, I didn't have to tell. And then of course, when it was finally announced that I was writing it. I then couldn't, I couldn't release, uh, I couldn't talk about the title then for another <laughs> month after month after month. That was October. Then, yeah, May at the Hay Festival, we uh, we revealed what the what the title was, and then of course we weren't allowed to give any plot details away. So I, <laughs> all the way through 2014. So it's been, I couldn't believe it. I actually, when someone um, when review copies went out, and I think it was uh, Amanda Craig, the, the New Statesman, just mentioned that she'd, you know, she'd got her copy and um, and mentioned a plot point and that she was enjoying it. Rather than sort of pick up on the fact that she was enjoying it, I just almost went into, oh my God, she's giving away the darting <laughs> 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 so, She said this, it's going to do it. It's fine, we just got a review plot. I was like, oh really? Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'll give up the condition to that, like that, for your eyes only top secret thing going on. Um, yeah, it just feels like that's going to be, that's going to be forever. So it'd be quite slightly surreal when I realised 
and people are actually going to be able to read this thing after, after all these months and all these different iterations. So yeah, it was so an exciting time, but yeah, it was just uh, it was it was odd doing something that was that was quite so secret. I can imagine that would have been the hardest secret to keep in the world yeah. as a writer. Yeah, and I was I was I was very good as well. I only really told you know my immediate family. I didn't tell any other other writers. So uh, did, did so you that, have to- that that kind of leads into the the first question about the young Bond really is is kind of like how did it come about of you getting the job? So they approached you. It wasn't something you actively pursued yourself. No, they. Uh, I just got a call from my agent one uh, early in December uh, two thousand and twelve, and I was having lunch, and the phone went, and it was my agent, and she said, "How would you like to write the new, you know, young Bond books?" Or and I, I said. Slightly liverish. I thought that's some, someone else's job, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and he said, oh, no, apparently Charlie doesn't want to do it. And uh, someone to continue the series. Um, so you don't get a call like that every day, of course. It was it was slightly, I think I was I was vaguely gobsmacked. And they say, yeah, they'll send you a full set of of all the Fleming books to uh, to, to look through and help you decide, whatever. And I said, well, thing. <laughs> uh, actually, I have a collection that looks the same. So I had mine were all kind of you know dotted around from different eras, you know, some second hand and some that I picked up. So it was a bit. Of, so it's quite nice to have a, have a complete you know modern set. We're all looking the same. Because um, uh, yeah, I mean, I thought I thought well, you know, interesting. You know, think about it carefully because it's it's one of those things that you know it can you know, take over a bit. Mm. Um, you have to be sure you want to you know, commit and do that. But but no, it was great. I was able to say that I wanted to do four books and I outlined my my vision for you know, what I'd do with it um, and and how I'd tackle it and some sample chapters and all the rest of it. So it, it kind of, it became, it was interesting. The, 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 the trial section, I wasn't up against anybody else, which was which was good, but I still had to prove to them that I could do it. Hmm. And and for me, those times were quite good because it was seeing whether I was I was the right fit for, for young Bond and he was the right fit for me, really, as, as a writer. Until you try it, you don't really know. I mean, I like to think I can write, you know, pretty much anything but until you actually do it um you don't know so it was an interesting interesting uh, way of, of us coming together and it took me you know, a while to get you know the the confidence i think to um to write for him properly because there were times when i was thinking you know how much am i meant to be channeling charlie higgs and how much am i meant to be channeling fleming how much am i meant to be channeling myself because presumably they've asked me because they think i can bring something to it yeah and uh, you know everyone has their own Interpreting the so it took a while to find the balance between the uh, the three voices, I think, and, and keep my own more dominant one, uh, whilst being in line with and respectful to what had come before. I knew I wanted to make it you know, my own thing. So, yeah, it was in terms of how it came about for me. It actually came about fairly fairly easily, and then over a lot of intensive writing, over a lot of late nights. Um, to just to kind of like get the feel of, of how I would write it. Um, so yeah, it was in terms of actually how it came to me. Though yes, they approached me, and I think I was the only person at that point that they'd approached. So that was that was fantastic. That felt very good. Nice. Awesome. Um, uh, we did hear some news. We don't know if this was actually true uh, that Young Bond was going to be updated to be set in the eighties with an almost sort of the equivalent of a Young Daniel Craig sort of era. Um, now, was there any truth to that? Did you hear anything along those lines, or no? That was that was basically um, a bit of a bit of a mis miscommunication. I think at a, at a spoken sort of, mirrors slightly. Yes, I was basically saying, you know, in terms of you know, would would the books follow on from from Charlie's? And I was saying, well, you know, <clears throat> I was explaining that a lot of people don't realise that the reason the the Young Bond books are set in the thirties is because you know they, they tie in directly with the Fleming books rather than with the movies, which is obviously they were set in the fifties. Um, I was saying, well, you know, what else? You know, I wasn't. Um, it wasn't a disappointment for me to do that because I was saying, what else could you do? You know, if you were to tie in with the movies, um, you'd always be moving forward in time. And you know, I said you could reboot it, you know, and have a young Bond in the eighties, but you know, he would have you know, a mullet, he'd be wearing, you know, sort of like pastel <laughs> Lachat who's on and like white jeans and chasing around with a mobile you know, phone the size of a brick. You know, it's not really the yeah. image of Bond we want to have in our minds. Yeah. And I think because I, I said that as an example, that then got said, oh, it was possible that, you know, it could have been done in the 80s. <laughs> you know, that, I'm glad it wasn't, put it that way. <laughs> that, that, was never, that was never anyone's intention. It's always been a, 
it's always been um, you know a, a direct continuation so when uh, when the the concept of young bond first came out with charlie's first book um i feel like a lot of bond fans myself included weren't perhaps the most receptive to the idea of reading about Bond as a boy. Because um, there's that whole thing of like Bond is this ultimate character and seeing mm. him as a kid would be a little bit jarring kind of thing. It wasn't until I read the book that I was like, actually, these are really, really good. And I, I loved them from the minute I, I first read them. Um, did you read uh, like Silverfin when it came out? Did you read through Charlie's books when they came out? Or was it something you came to a bit later? Yeah, I read Silverfin when it came out um, and enjoyed it. But didn't get to uh, to grips with the later ones, mainly because by then I started off as a, as a children's book editor. And I find that if I read ch- children's fiction, I tend to go into edit, edit mode and I get frustrated because the book's finished. You know, it's pointless being in editor mode, but I ended up wanting to, you know, just sort of like, you know, make little notes or tweaks or whatever. And it just annoys me. So I tend to read a lot of nonfiction and, and biography now. So as my fiction has sort of like taken off over the last 10 years, that's kind of been where it's you know, it sort of take me further away from that, but um, it was great to go back and and then read them. You know, with, with, with intent, if you like. Um, and uh, and what impressed me was that yes, these were not. You know, it wasn't a diluted version of you know, some mish, some sloppy mishmash of like bomb tropes shoved into a children's book. That wasn't what they were trying to be. They were first and foremost interested in telling you know, an exciting story um, and showing you a, a character that. What I love about the young Bond character is that we know how he ends up. So what you can do is then, you know, push him along that road. You start to sort of shape him a bit and, you know, and put him through some things. Um, and so, uh, and, and make it, you know, and hopefully try and, you know, get all the excitement and, and intrigue and adventure of a, of a Fleming novel and, and distill that into, you know, put it through, a, yeah, filter it slightly through uh, the, the, the teen prism so you can't go, you know, too far with, with certain aspects, but um, but you can still be quite full blooded about it and uh, and tell a tale that you know well you it has to engage its target audience, but you hope others will will come to it and enjoy it as well. I imagine I, you have to be a little bit delicate with the Bond girls. Yes, yeah, <laughs> I think so. Um, and you know, I'm very uh, very aware that when you're writing it, you don't want to exclude anybody, and I, I don't believe that that you know that Bond is is just for just for boys only um at the same time yeah i mean it what was helpful with it all i think is that because we know that bond doesn't lose his virginity until he's 16 in that, uh, that brothel in paris mm. um then no, well it, <laughs> <laughs> that that's uh you know, that that level doesn't you know books don't have to engage with with james discovering sex um you can approach the bond girl situation in different and more imaginative ways if you like than, than just the inevitable they're going to have sex you know you can explore it in different ways and there might be an element of romance but i think it's much more about james sort of like meeting you know an equal or someone who has um, a skill set that maybe he doesn't yet or you know there's there's different ways of, of bringing them together and still you can still i think you know even the Fleming books the, the, the bond girl is is comes from within the narrative she's not bolted on as a piece of glamour in the way that often in the movies they they perhaps are so, in a way, writing you know, for young Bond, you know, you're, you're just bringing that girl into the narrative and, and having her, you know, play, play a key part of telling the story. That's that's what she's there, just like any other character. She earns her place on the page by by being able to push the plot forward and uh, and being you know equipped and able enough to be an asset to uh, to the situation rather than you know a damsel in distress who's going to you know, scream for rescue the whole time. Oh, that sounds good. So when when you sort of went through the Fleming, uh, sort of read them again, knowing that you'll be doing Young Bond, did you come across instances where you were like, "Oh, now this is interesting. This is something that could be used potentially in in my in sort of my Young Bond series, which hasn't been done before." Did you did you sort of have moments where you were reading it, thinking, "Wow, this is sort of an area that I could allude to and and uh, sort mm. of become quite quite." Uh, you know, if you if you find something like that, suddenly you get a bit of adrenaline going in, and, and the excitement. So you think, oh, that's something that I could definitely use. Yes, yes. I mean, there is. You know, it's kind of obviously. I wish that I would. I'd done the first because there's there's lots of stuff. You know, you think, damn, Charlie got there first. You know, <laughs> I'd have liked to have done the scar. You know, the scar on the face. Damn. Um, <laughs> but there's still, um, yeah, there's still elements and, and bits you read through. You think, oh yeah, I could, I can allude to that, or I can, yeah, I can maybe sort of like set set that up I mean, there's a couple of instances in, in shoot to kill of of things like that 
happening um, where you can just sort of sow the seeds for stuff that will then turn up in in uh, in, in the novels themselves. Um, things like the, uh, you know, just a little nod to um, the connection between the Pearl Divers and uh, Hollywood in You Only Live Twice, for example. It's just a little, little aspect you can just put in there, um, which, you know, may well go over the head of, of the target reader, but it won't distract either. And then, you know, a Fleming fan will say, aha, we have <laughs> yeah. that link to uh, Kissy Suzuki or whatever. So things like that, yeah, they're, they're great fun going through. And it's just, you know, you read it with just a little different eye, you realise, you know, you think, oh, so he was going, you know, rock climbing when he was, you know, 16, okay, make a note of that, or, or we like to listen to this song um, when he was a child, or whatever. And there's little references to his childhood, they're very few, but you just take little bits like that, and it just helps you when you're trying to build a picture of what his childhood must have been like, you know, um, an austere school atmosphere, but a lot of privilege as well in, in that life, and obviously developing a lot of the traits we see him developing as an adult. And, um, over the four books, as as far as I'm able, I want to um, you know I want to just push him forward. I think the good thing about anchoring it in a proper year, you know, in an actual year against historical fact, you know, in the 30s, you've got a very interesting political situation. And it's quite nice to sort of like tie bond to some of those instances, so we can see that there will be a progression as we move forward towards his war years, you know, and, and, and the gradual worsening of the political situation in the 30s. Um, is actually a bit of a mirror to today, which is another another reason why it's, it's really good fun to write for. You know, you can see in the wake of a Great Depression, a rise of political extremism, um, there are certain similarities there. So you can actually, you know, tell plots that are still relevant despite the historical setting. In some ways, they're more relevant. And the, but you can do it without having to rely on the trappings of a, of a technological society, which are quite hampering to a, to a spy novel or a, or a thriller of that sort, because you don't have quick transport, you don't have instant communication, and you don't have an app in your phone that can tell you exactly where you are at some point and bring in backup. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to, uh, to kind of like to look at the past in that way and, and yeah, take it as inspiration for the future. That's, that's kind of what the whole thing is about. That's a really interesting angle, actually. That's, uh, that's something I'm going to look out for. I'm, I've, I've got my copy of Sheet Skill here. I'm about halfway through um, hey. at the moment. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I'm hey, enjoying yeah. it. And- Bond's, uh, Bond's just in a, in a pharmacy with uh, the reporter on the telephone. That's what I'm oh, saying to avoid spoilers. spoilers. That's where I'm at. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so I suppose like when you take over a character that was created by some, someone else, there's always that danger of you know readers perhaps feeling they really know that character and saying you know you know Bond wouldn't say that or Bond wouldn't do that. Like so, how do you approach writing somebody else's character? Do you like sit down and sort of break it down, or, or is it something you just felt like you knew already? No, well, it, it, as I say, it took a little while to to really feel I, I had a proper handle on it because um, I realised in my very first draft of Shoot to Kill that he was quite, he could be passive in certain scenes. There are other people in the scenes I'd normally have him quieter and listening and watching rather than driving the scene forward. Um, and that was pointed out to me that I, I wasn't making him quite you know, as loud as, as as he could be, mm-hmm. and I think that was maybe that I was still feeling my way into it and not quite sure how to how to treat him. So for the second draft, I because they had they'd liked what I'd done first time round, and we were enthusiastic about that. It gave me that much more confidence to um, to get to grips with him and to ultimately not worry too much about you know how others would would find him. I had to really find how you know how. He spoke to me really, because yeah. um, you know he was he was going to be my my character for the next few books. I was going to um, say, well, this is this is my take on on Bond, and I guess you know obviously it's, it's very different from the way the actors play them, but they all have to kind of they bring a part of themselves to the part inevitably, but by being them. And I think it's the same as, as a writer; you use it and bring elements of yourself to it. You know, you, it's unavoidable because you're the one <laughs> who's writing it. It's going to be your you have to understand him as a character. It might your understanding of him might not be identical to everybody else's, mm-hmm. but it's one you you go with, and um, and you you know the the good people at uh, Ian Fleming Publications will will give me a steer if they think that I'm going too far away from the character. And of course, they're they're across all media; they know they know what uh, what Bond's like. So I have that as a as a fallback. But generally, you know, our, our views have have converged. Um, I might be always trying to push it slightly further than they would like, but then that's kind of my job as the author and it's and it's their job as the the, uh, the gatekeepers to uh, to rein in any excesses I might bring to that. So um, it's a good it's a good creative tension. They're not at all prescriptive in what they want. They leave it to me to come up with the plot and, and the story and and basically um yeah they'll give me a steer on 
on how they think the character is. So yeah, it's good. Cool. So you mentioned that obviously this is going to be a four book series. Now, when when um, you started developing the story that you had in mind, do you do you sort of um, have a skeleton idea of what's going to be in each of the four books, and then perhaps have something in book one which is influenced by ultimately something that happens in the final book in book four um do you you kind of know okay obviously book one you're going to know because that's what you're working on but with book two three and four do you know what's going to happen to bond by the end of book four and and have little plot points of how he's going to get there which influences the first book or do you just go okay this is book one done this is book two done and like that i think you're always you're always thinking ahead as as a writer, because you you don't want just to kind of like just to point him and like push him off without having a vague plan of where that will end up. So yeah, part of part of my brief was to uh, to work out, you know, perhaps an arc of yeah. you know throughout the four books. But um, whether that's an arc of character or an arc of plot or a, an arc of whatever, I'm not going to say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, there's there's a couple of a uh, couple of points along the narrative path I want to take in and um, and we'll see what happens that sounds very exciting so uh, how, with regard to that how are you approaching Bond as he grows up is it like each book going to be maybe a year in his life or are you sort of not going to mention that like Fleming or, or how's that playing out um, I don't really kind of want to want to say too much at the moment just because I don't want to sort of spoil the surprise of, of, of how it goes but um, I'm, I don't think there'll be any any hurry to uh to wage bomb that that extremely um i think you have to you know we, we know the kind of the, the patch of the playground we're, we're playing in. um that said you know anything can happen you know and uh, and things things do change over time um and if it's uh, if it benefits the plot then there's discussions to be had so we'll see as we go forward is my uh, my cryptic response <laughs> 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 so just just briefly going back to when you were first sort of approached to 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 um to do the bomb book now obviously before you can get the definite green light you had to sort of show them a sample of of, of what you had in mind uh, and everything like that just yep. just to obviously show that you could write it and everything now with the idea that you came up with initially it, how similar is that to sort of the finished article within with book one? Is 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 your sort of initial idea? Is that did that come to fruition, or or was that just to sort of show? Okay, he's got the idea in terms of he can write, you know, he can he can come up with ideas. But it was a different situation for book one. No, it actually ended up being pretty pretty close to what I had. Um, That's good. It was always going to be in the Hollywood setting. You know, I was very keen on. And that came about because I was thinking, well, you know, we're, it's, a new, it's a fresh start. Obviously, it's the sixth young Bond. And I was thinking of parallels with the, the sixth Fleming Bond, which is Dr. No, which, of course, was the jumping up, you know, the starting point for the films. And I thought, well, you know, if the sixth book was like a start for the movies, then maybe the sixth young Bond should go to the movies, but in, you know, a, a literary way. And so, I like and, it. It's good. And he hadn't been, hadn't been there before, so it seemed like, you know, it was a good, a good setting. And then, of course, that gets you into the whole, you know, the the star of the whole film noir thing as well and you know the, the gangster movies in the 30s that were kind of like very popular around that time so that that then fed into the the plot of what it you know might be good to do and you had the the rise of the uh you know the the huge movie moguls in that period as well as hollywood really took took off and became more recognizable as the hollywood of you know we have today um i'd done weirdly i'd done um film studies at university um, and my tutor there was Charlie Hickson's brother, Andrew Hickson. <laughs> uh, so um, a lot of the, uh, the you know, and, and I did um, you know seminars in genre cinema in the, in the 30s, and the gangster movie was was one of the ones we did. So in a way, I had two Hicksons at my back with uh, <laughs> with this one. Um, That's a useful with, bit of trivia, I think. Podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's quite a funny one. Now. Um, <laughs> so yes, yeah, meeting Andrew uh, way way back in that would have been about 1990. So. Um, yeah, so it was nice to uh, to bring that to it. So yeah, all these all these elements in the title, which was uh, the first and only title you know I had, that was these things were were you know found favour with uh, with the Flemings. So um, it proceeded pretty smoothly. Um, there was so in yeah those early chapters remained the same in the first draft. They changed in the second draft as I kind of made, brought 
when you're doing a sample chapter, you're, you're trying out for a job, and you're sort of you're, so you're showing you know you can do different things. There was like an action bit, and there was more of a kind of a conversational bit. Um, but it was felt you know the conversational bit early on was was holding things back. So I uh, I wrote in a new a new introduction to Bond where he's in pretty much threatened with a knife the second he arrives at this this new school <laughs> to make it you know that much more action packed to go straight in with it. So um, things like that changed, but but the actual you know the the, the core of the storyline has remained the same all the way through pretty much. Except that, um, well, uh, having having brought a, a zeppelin into things to um, facilitate high speed travel to uh, America, um, it would have been rude not to do more with the zeppelin. So uh, I, I sort of changed changed the uh, the climax slightly between storyline and uh, finished thing. Very nice. So uh, I can already anticipate the answer to this question, but uh, we've heard you've already turned in the second, well, your second young Bond novel. Um, are you able to give us any hints as to what we can expect from the follow-up? No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely none. Right? Um, I am, I'm about to start uh, rewrites on that uh, this week, um, which, is, uh, which is exciting because um, I've had uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of uh, thoughts and ideas on on that. Um, it was it was quite a, a busy process writing book two because I was also promoting book one at around about the same time, mm-hmm. and uh, there was you know there was most of November was spent on tour promoting it. There was a ten day tour around this publication that covered you know from the south of England up to um, Scotland, and then I did a week in Scotland um, later in November, and an awful lot of um, you know Q and As and interviews and you know, newspaper articles yeah, and radio interviews you know it actually took me back how much you know interest you know, there was when I was actually you know, a part of it it was interesting just how much publicity there was to do for, for that um, and again it kind of which was wonderful and good fun but it took away from the the writing process a little because I was actually running out of time trying to get an extension saying I'm so busy promoting it I'm not getting a chance to write the new one uh, <laughs> So uh, yeah, it's been interesting. So I'm looking forward to having that, that bit more time now to uh, finesse and polish and um, and go through and um, and yeah, we'll we'll see what we'll see what happens. Cool. Um, do you know, do you know if it will be released in 2015 or would it likely to be a year after? I'm not sure. I think um, there's discussions are afoot. You know, in, in the wake of uh, Spectre coming out, I think um, obviously that's going to um, be affecting the whole the whole positioning of, of lots of things. Um, yeah. So, so we'll see. We'll see what happens because obviously, um, Shoot to Kill is still in hardback and it's going to be coming out into paperback. The exact time that happens, um, you know, I think uh, yeah, there is a there is a there is a planned date. I think for uh, um, around about May time, but um, but you know, who knows? This is the world of of young <laughs> Bond and 007. You know, things can things can come out and uh, <laughs> and surprise just when you least expect it. <laughs> We did have a few of our overseas listeners from the US and Canada who wanted to ask when there'd be a, a Canadian or North American release for Shoot to Kill. Would you have a date for that at all? I wish I wish I did. Um, it's something that, you know, obviously I'm very keen to see happen as well. Yeah. And I'm assured, I'm assured that uh, movement is being made. Um, but I have no no firm dates. You know, I'm, I'm just a writer. You know, I'm the last person to know, really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> These things happen that, at, at a higher level. <laughs> There'll be a big audience for it over there. I'm, I'm pretty sure. So hopefully, yeah, it'll I would hope so. I would hope so. Um, as I say, I don't, I don't know the the ins and outs of the situation because it's it's kind of all handled by, uh, you know, the the, the Flemish dedicated agents. Um, but um, no, it's. I think there's much awareness that there is a, a demand for it, you know, and fantastic that there is. You know, I'm I'm really pleased. So yes, I'm I'm very keen for it to get out there as as quickly as possible. It's certainly not down to me in any way. If it was down to me, it would be uh, it would be everywhere by right now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just uh, just the last couple of questions then to to round things off. Um, firstly, you mentioned Spectre there. What what were your thoughts about the new film? My first thought was ooh. <laughs> 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 um, which was uh, which was good, yeah. I was, and that was nice. It was actually it was the day I was handing in my um, my young Bond book, so it was that was like a nice little. Actually, it was very distracting. It was, I was I was desperately up against it, trying to finish it in time, and I kept thinking, "Oh, I want to read about Spectre." <laughs> uh, I was I was very excited the idea of um, Daniel Craig coming up against you know a, a Blofeld character and wondering how they would you know reboot that. We've seen some very exciting reboots of of different characters, you know, in modern genre stuff. The way 
you know, Moriarty's been rebooted for Sherlock, the way the Master's been rebooted for Doctor Who. I'm um, thinking the way that, you know, we'll see a Spectre kind of made relevant to a, a 2015 audience is going to be exciting, I think. I think it's um, it's a great title. Um, one of those ones that if you know about Bond, then you know what it means. And if you don't, it just sounds like a cool title, you know. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I was very, very excited. Uh, really good cast as well for this one. Yeah, Brilliant isn't cast. it? Fantastic. Yeah, no, go I, might, I think when Tom sends over his video of the James Bond Island, he should also send you his audio clip of basically when they released the title, you know, and um, they did it through the internet. And we had uh, a few of the James Bond radio people were all listening at the same time. We're online sort of doing a message thing. Uh, Tom happened to be in Thailand at the time and he recorded his reaction. So he just pressed record and then sort of just you know, about uh, a minute before it came up. And then he recorded his reaction, and it's priceless. So I'll ask Tom to send you his response to when he saw the title. You're going to embarrass because... me now, Chris. <laughs> no, you'll like it, Steve. It's fun. It's really fun. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I'll basically our very final question is, now, if money was no object and you could make any Bond film that you wanted with any person playing Bond, any uh, actor doing the villain, any actress playing the Bond girl, any plot, title and location in the world, what would you do? <laughs> oh, no. In no way a posing question to finish off on then. Um, <laughs> gosh, that's a, that's, that's a pretty hard one. Um, I'd quite like Hayley Atwell to, uh, to be my Bond girl. Um, she would be she's nice actually I was very lucky to, you know, I wrote a, an audio Doctor Who play um, that she acted in so I met her and she was absolutely stunning in, in real life as she is in the movies and such a you know so unaffected by by her fame um, so yeah she was she was great um, so I'd like her in it straight away um, we have to, I suppose we'd have to have a bond as well wouldn't we so um, um, I don't know I, I, I'd quite like um a total unknown to come out and, and be my bond. I'm not sure I'd like, it'd be quite nice to have a character that would just come out and, and no one would have any preconceptions of in a way. But as for, uh, as for who that would be, I don't know. That's, uh, that's one of those ones that's going to, it's going to, yeah, it's going to bug me. Um, I quite like uh, David Bowie to do the, uh, the theme. I think that'd be good. I think, you know, it's about time he did one. It's been, you know, he's been around pretty much the whole time. He could, you know, he could have by now have come up with something. So I think Bowie should do that. Um, in terms of, uh, oh, what would you do? Gosh, Shatterhand would be a good title, I think. Oh, that's nice. a favourite of mine. Very as well, good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it has to be used at some point, doesn't it? Doesn't it? I mean, it's one of those things you think, yeah, that's it's just a cool, it's a cool title. It's you know, and just thrown away in a reference. You need you need kind of like, yeah, that's a big box office thing, I reckon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, there you are. There's a few ideas. Cool. Very cool. nice. Well, uh, just to finish up then, so where can uh, our listeners find you online? You know, websites, Twitters, Facebooks, that kind of thing. Um, well, there's my Facebook page, Steve Cole Books. There's also the Young Bond Facebook page um, where stuff gets posted there. Um, I have, because I also, I, I, as well as Young Bond, I, I write uh, other fiction as well, um, you know, sort of younger fiction. So my website kind of like covers stuff from you know, for, for younger readers as well who aren't really allowed at the, the bond stuff yet mm -hmm. so um my various iterations are all <laughs> out there doing different things so uh in terms of actual bond stuff i'd say it's probably my my facebook page and twitter account at steve cole books um and uh and yeah the young bond facebook page and the website as well of course i do stuff for that and you know blogs all over the place as well these days you have to kind of like blog blog your life away mm -hmm. in terms of uh, that so i was doing you know my five favorite bond villains for you know the scottish book trust the other day so little guest posts appear all over the place um so yes yeah, so i i am about online um uh just don't shout at me too much <laughs> <laughs> cool stuff. well uh, well thanks for joining us steve in the words of roger moore it's been quite illuminating <laughs> hey. uh, it's been a pleasure steve it's been great great to meet you and a uh, great interview as well really insightful for everyone Oh, well, it was good fun. So thanks very much, guys. Cool. Well, uh, we'll have to get you back when uh, book two comes out. Indeed. I'd love to. And, uh, and yes, yeah, send, on, send on your vids. Cool. Will do. Will do. <laughs> All right. Thanks, then, Steve. Take care. Nice one. Cheers, then, guys. Take Bye -bye care, Steve. Bye. 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 Okay, so thanks again to Steve for uh, giving us some time there and, uh, and talking all about Bond. What a lovely guy. Yeah, super, super top, uh, well, super nice chat, really, isn't it? Yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, 
yeah, it's great. And it's nice, you know, there were one or two things again prior to this interview that I wasn't aware of. And, and the thing that I like most is, is finding out what other people, you know, people that I know that are Bond fans, what do they like about Bond? You mm. know, what, what, what makes them tick? How do they sort of find out about it? You know, and just hearing other people's passions, you know, obviously you and I, uh, get to hear each, how passionate each other are mm. about Bond quite regularly. Every two but weeks it, on James Bond Radio. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, it is, it's really nice to hear other people's passion and, and, and how much they're up for Bond. And, uh, you know, it's like a family, isn't it? We are it like is. one big family, a Bond fraternity that crosses oceans, the world, you know, everyone that's a fan in the world, we're all part of the brotherhood of Bond. There you go, you absolutely, completely. Yeah. But I, I suppose for me, a concern I always have, whether it's a you know a new writer or a new director that's coming in to do one of the films, my concern always is, are they going to know Bond really? Or are they just somebody who's been a casual fan over the years and just fancies a go? And yeah. the good thing from speaking to Steve is you know that he really knows Bond yeah. sort of inside and out. And when we actually talk about the book in a minute, you kind of, you know, some of those links he puts in, the casual fan wouldn't know that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So it's it's good to know that young Bond is in safe hands kind of thing yeah. with somebody who I, knows I think, what they're doing. I, yeah, no, definitely. I think that's the case with a lot of stuff. You know, you'll always think, oh, you know, is, is that the right person or not? But, you know, Eon, Ian Fleming Foundation, they know what they're doing they wouldn't choose i don't think they'd ever choose sort of a non-bond fan i mean i don't know if all the adult continuation or adult bond continuation authors were big bond fans or not they must have had some interest i'm sure but mm. you know it i'm sure it helps if if you turn up on the job and say actually yeah i love bond yeah <laughs> as yeah, opposed completely. to i've never i've never heard of him before what's that about yeah. sort of thing but you know yeah it's yeah. interesting though isn't it as well like you were saying how they sort him out rather than the other way around yeah. Um, to do the job. It's kind of like they must have kind of like, how did they know that he was a Bond fan? Do you know what I mean? Like, had, yeah. had, I guess like there was a couple of other books he's written, other kids books that had yeah. like secret agent in the title and stuff. So maybe that That's helped. It. But it's uh, it's funny that they approached him and he just happened to be a major Bond fan yeah. at the same time, which is pretty cool. Yeah, um, so Shoot to Kill. Right. We both read it recently, cover to cover. We've just we've finished it. We've both got our copies to hand. There it is. Lovely. Um now, like we said, it's not been uh, released in the States yet, so our American yeah. listeners won't or have had Canada. a chance to read it, yeah. or Canada, or North America in okay. in yeah. general, I suppose. Um, but um, you can order it from Amazon.co.uk if you want to get it. Um, I, that's because I'm obviously in the States at the moment. That's what I did. Ordered it from Amazon.co.uk, and like maybe 10 days later, it showed up on my doorstep. So, or um, if, if someone wants to order it from North America, um, and, and if they want to pay my flight over, I'd happily deliver it for them. Oh, there you go. There's there's so a there's, nice there's the uh, alternative option. <laughs> a delivery service from Mr. Chris Wright. There you go. Good stuff. Um, so I suppose the best place to, I suppose, like we said, we're not going to go scene by scene and go super spoiler style on, on this. We're just going to be talking about the book generally because obviously it's new. Um, so we're going to start off by talking about kind of young Bond as a concept in itself. Now, I will firmly put my hand up and say when they announced Charlie's first book, I was like, this. I, I don't want anything to do with this. I don't want to hear about Bond as a, as a young boy. I had a horrible images of like James Bond Jr. running around oh, yeah. with gadgets and like a little mini Q and a little mini M giving him uh, giving him missions. And like, if you haven't read any young Bond yet, like, don't worry because like the ho- they've just done it really well in the sense that it fits in with the Fleming timeline. And there's like a there's like a just a, a magical feel about it. I, I would say, for want of a better word. Um, in the sense that it covers all the backstory that we know Fleming gave him. Um, obviously, Fleming only ever mentioned, like, you know, he went to Eton, for example, and he got expelled from Eton and all those kind of things. And they've kind of, you know, Charlie and Steve between them have kind of put together, filled in the blanks, basically. And and I love it. What do you think? No, Well, I'm kind of the same as, same as you, really. When it first came out, I had horror thoughts about James Bond Jr. as well. And I remember Silver Finn came out and I thought, well, you know, I, I'm an adult. That book's not really aimed at me. I'm sure it's just for kids. So I actually bought it for my brother for his birthday. Um, I was trying to kind of get him into Bond, uh, into Bond fan. Um, and he, he, he'd seen one or two of the films, but he, he, didn't, he wasn't hooked. So I thought, well, I'll try the literary side. So yeah. I bought him The Young Bond. I'm not actually sure if you've read it or not. Um, but I, I remember thinking, well, hang on a minute. 
you know, why don't I give it a go? And 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 one day I I decided to pick it up, and yeah, I read it, and I was really impressed. I was like, well, hang on a minute, this is this is a lot better than I thought it was going to be, and a lot more sort of varied in terms of the potential audience than I thought it might have. Yeah. So as a concept, I was the same as you. I was initially unsure, uncertain. Um, but now, I mean, I've read all the Higsons, obviously just read Shoot to Kill as well. And it's just a big double thumbs up because they are classic. They are really, really good. The detail is brilliant. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah. it's great. The way they've kind of executed it is, is, is just perfect in the sense that obviously you read about Bond as a kid and it's like you, as adults, like you say, the, the story isn't aimed at us. But it is totally readable. And I was like, I read through those books faster than I've read a lot of kind of, you know, adult books for over the last few years. I was like, I just yeah. poured through them because they're just so good. Um, and the way like Charlie would weave in the Fleming isms and little references and stuff, like you knew he was a massive or is a massive Bond fan and really took his time and made it a classy adventure, not just like some random kid storybook kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so if you've been sort of too cautious to get involved in Young Bond, just give like Silverfin or indeed Shoot to Kill a try um, and uh, and see what you think. Um, but uh, but in order to talk about Shoot to Kill, I thought what we do is we I, I just read the blurb from the hardcover so we can see what the premise of the book is and, and kind of take from there. So, young Bond is back in his most action-packed explosive adventure yet. Now, they probably say that in every single yeah, About book, every single one, His yeah. most action-packed. <laughs> um, expelled from Eton and determined never to trust again, James Bond's plans for a solitary summer are dashed by the discovery of a gruesome film reel a real someone is willing to kill for. Travelling from the English countryside to Los Angeles, James finds himself caught up in a sinister plot of blackmail, murder and revenge that goes way beyond any Hollywood gangster movie. His friends in danger, his life on the line, James must find a way out or die trying. So there it is. That's that's the kind of setting. And I would say, actually, like, obviously, Charlie's books covered a, a certain period in, in, in his life up to the point that he gets expelled from Eton. And then Steve Cole's literally carrying on from there and, and doing that. But I wouldn't say you'd have to go back and read all the Charlies to read this book. No, no, not at all. I mean, there are little links within the book that do sort of go back, uh, refer to sort of Bond uh, during the time that he would have been in the Higson books. But no, it doesn't affect it. I mean, you definitely enjoy it if you did do that. But if you wanted to get on Shoot to Kill straight away, there, you know, there wouldn't be an issue. You know, you, no, you could... It, it's not like you're getting, yeah. It's not like you're getting references to characters that you would have known in the Higson period no. to, to enjoy this. It's, it's its own like it's literally if the Higson period was chapter one, like this is like the new chapter, and it's like a it's almost like a fresh start. But it, it carries on from that period, but they don't sort of mesh too much. So you don't you yeah. could start off and shoot to kill if you wanted to. Um, now the first thing that made me smile. Pretty much as soon as I kind of open the book. So I'm, I'm opening it and thinking, okay, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read this. The opening chapter is called You Asked For It. Now. That's a good chapter. It is a good chapter title. And I'll tell you why it's a good chapter title. It's because You Asked For It was the title given to the first US paperback version of Casino Royale. So there, it, straight away, I'm reassured, like, Steve knows what he's doing. He, like, yeah. He's, you know he's, he's a Bond fan. Right there from the off, don't you? Exactly. Yeah. So I was very happy with that. A great little uh, chapter title to kick things off with. So I suppose, again, without going into kind of any spoilers, there's two main locations in this book, isn't there? You've got Bond in England at school, and then you've got Bond when he crosses the Atlantic and goes to LA. Um, so talking about kind of like before we actually get talking about the actual characters, let's talk about some of those locations and kind of how they, they kind of affect things. So at the end of uh, By Royal Command, obviously, uh, Charlie's last book, you're at the point where Bond's been expelled from Eton and he's kind of, you know, he's 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 been a bad boy, he's, so to speak. He's had and enough as well, hasn't he? He's indeed, like, he's had enough of yeah. the, the kind of the stiff-ass kind of nature of, of, of the old school kind of education system. So in this, at the beginning of this, Bond's aunt Charmian has sent him to Dartington Hall School in Devon. Now, I looked this up and it's actually a real place, which is great. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to read a little blurb from, uh, from about what Dartington School was at the time. And uh, and we can sort of explore that a little bit. So Dartington Hall School, Totnes, Devon, was founded in 1926 
and it offered a progressive co-educational boarding life. When it started, there was a minimum of formal classroom activity and the children learnt by involvement in estate activities. It was to have no corporal punishment, indeed no punishment at all, no prefects, no uniforms, no officers, training corps, no segregation of the sexes, no compulsory games, no compulsory religion or compulsory anything else, no more Latin, no more Greek, no more competition, no jingoism. With time, more academic rigor was imposed, but it remained progressive and had mixed success educating the children, sometimes the more wayward ones of the fee-paying intelligentsia. At its peak, the school had some 300 pupils. However, with the advent of state-based progressive education, the death of its founders and the appointment of a new headmaster who was at odds with the school's philosophies and subsequently generated a significant amount of negative publicity, the school suffered a dramatic drop in recruitment. Despite the efforts of those who cared the most about the school, it finally shut its doors in 1987. Yeah. So a couple of things that interest me about that is... Yeah. It's like bonds are eaten, couldn't be more like, you know, rigid kind of old school traditional education with all that kind of stuff. There's like the canings and all that yeah, kind of stuff. Rule, for those, book and everything like exactly. That, and yeah. the, the silly top hats and briefcases there to carry and all that kind of rubbish. Um, and then this school is like the perfect opposite of that, where it's like, and, and there's a line in that description, which kind of makes me think that totally relates to bond is it says, um, it had mixed success educating the children, sometimes the more wayward ones of the fee-paying intelligentsia. So that is what Bond would have been as a kid, wouldn't he? He'd have yeah. been like a lost kid. Obviously, his parents are dead. Um, and uh, and he would have been a sort of, I would imagine, a bit of a rebellious one who who kind of wouldn't stick to those rules, so, so to speak. So mm-hmm. as like a location for Bond to start off Steve Cole's journey, I think that's a great choice. What do you think? Yeah, well, it's almost it's almost so perfect that if you hadn't had known it was real, you would have thought, oh, they just he just made it up because yeah. because you know talking about a school that hasn't got rules, you know, it's mixed. Uh, obviously, back in the day, males and females were generally, or especially at boarding school, were were separated. You know, nothing was compulsory. It's sort of free learning. That sort of thing you just wouldn't have thought existed um but like you said it, it's a perfect sort of counterbalance to what eaton was with bond um and i think i think it was great to have bond in that environment and just see how he reacted and um and obviously it was a good place for potential other characters as well because because it's it, it was so um you know unique in a way it, it had an interesting um sort of purpose to see how other people should would be in that yeah so sort of in, in the sense that like okay so you've gone with the hickson books and he's in that kind of really rigid uh, sort of environment of eaton and then this is just like the po- post polar opposite of that and it's cool to see like how that would have affected bond's character as he grew up and i feel like you know as far as i'm aware dartington hall school was never mentioned by fleming so it's it's something that steve has come up with yeah. but i feel like that is the perfect choice. Like had Fleming fleshed out his backstory even more, I feel like a school like this would have yeah. been a part of it maybe, you know, yeah, um, definitely. you know, again, if, it's another factor which just shows you that Steve Cole knew he's, he's on it, isn't he? He's, yeah, he's wired absolutely. up. He, he knows, you, you know, cause Fleming, about. Fleming was one against going against the establishment really on, on some level, wasn't he? Even though he was yeah. from that, like with the whole banking family and all that kind of business, like the way he thought about things, um, was very sort of against that sort of establishment thing, so I, I think that was a, a, a great, uh, a great thing. So, like when you're kind of at that school, it feels like a, the story feels like a very sort of classic kids' adventure story, doesn't it? It's like you know, I, I hark back to like. I suppose those stories you read as a kid, like the famous fives and all those kinds of things. Do you know what I mean? It has that kind of sort of magical old school feel about it, uh, which is cool. And then. Um, Basically, and this isn't a spoiler because it's literally on the front cover, um, there's, uh, you know, Bond takes a journey on an airship over to the States, over to uh, to LA, and then the kind of the second half of the story takes place in, in the States. Um, and you pointed out, didn't you, there's, there's, there's some interesting, like, little seeds that he's taken from sometimes the books, sometimes the movies, and just kind of, like, put it into this story in a slightly different way. So how do you feel about the whole airship? thing well i i i thought it was a great idea i mean it it's sort of you know it was set in in the 30s the airship is such a um a visually striking uh form of transport you know when you can picture it well you know you've seen the pictures um and i think obviously in terms of the hints you know you've you've got hints of a view to a kill there with, with the airships obviously zoran had an airship 
Um, but no, I think it's a great because it is. It's, it's almost a bit like you know if you think about a hovercraft, it's mm. kind of like an adventurous form of transport. Yeah, and and, and an air blimp is even more so. You know, um, and back then it, it would be the height of of sort of luxury. It's almost like the Titanic of the air. Yeah, know? that's um, true. That's I, a good point. And only the super mega rich would have would have been able to afford it. Um, so again, you're you're taking Bond in, into this sort of almost uh, luxurious sort of world. Um, but it's sort of a fascinating vehicle, isn't it? It's it's he it, it could have done a ship, but that's kind of been done a lot before in various yeah. things. But just the air, the air sort of limp is. is I great. thought I thought it was really cool in the sense that, like with a with a zeppelin, it's like it's a very romantic image, isn't it, of that time, yeah. like the thirties? And I, I believe I read somewhere that this book is set in nineteen thirty four. So it's yeah. like you know pre war, obviously, and yeah. and it's kind of I, I feel like that just really works. Like when you think of you know, there's the uh, Indiana Jones movie with the, with the Zeppelin, isn't, isn't there? And it's just kind of, it feels adventurous, you know, and exciting because, yeah. like, who gets to go on one of those? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like a snapshot of history that most of us won't ever experience. Yeah. Um, Why didn't they bring him back? I'd be up for one. Yeah, absolutely. Just don't fill him with, was it hydrogen that was in it? That's why Hydrogen's a dodgy down. one, yeah. yeah. If you if you fill it with helium, it's not too bad, but it's the hydrogen ones uh, uh, you want to avoid, a, a lighter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't let Felix anywhere near one. Yeah. Um, that was a bad joke, I apologise. I liked it, I thought it was but, good. <laughs> thank you. Um, but then, so after that, after they land, they're in, uh, in Los Angeles. So... For me, that doesn't strike me as a particularly Bondian location, LA, until, like until this point. In the sense that it's like we were saying, like there's there's plenty of places Bond hasn't been on film before, like you know, mm. Australia, for example. He hasn't been to Rome on film, but Rome feels like a Bondian location. Obviously, yeah. he's going to be there in Spectre, but Australia perhaps doesn't really feel like a Bondian location, and I feel probably the same about LA. Well, what do you think? Yeah, no, I agree. Actually, it's almost like. If you just heard it on the off the cuff, sort of, oh yeah, Bond's going to LA, you'd think, oh well, that doesn't quite sound right. It doesn't quite yeah. feel right. But again, the fact that it is set in the thirties, you've got that was in Hollywood heyday, you know. Yeah. Um, that was the magic was Hollywood. It was massive. It was again, you've got the sort of um, affluent people that would either you know own the studios or or go there, and and you've got the stars. Um, and 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 it had a, it had you know obviously it's got a magic today but back then was the the sort of uh, epitome of sort of class and 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 that sort of style yeah I different. I think when you put it in the setting of 1934 like it's a different world like yeah it's you know you can picture everybody walking along the street with like you know the fedora hats on and all that kind of stuff and dressed all up in suits and and the old school cars going around it's mm. I suppose it, like you see LA in so many films and that these days that it's sort of old news really isn't it in yeah. in this sort of setting but but the like i feel it works like when i when i first read the kind of the description when this book was announced i was like bon in la no, i don't know about that but the way it's done i'm really happy with it i think yeah. it's it's really cool and it's again like for me i suppose what makes a bonding location is something that's like there's some history there and some like real glamour and some real kind of class, like somewhere like Rome or Paris immediately feels bonded. Do you know what I mean? Whereas LA is a relatively new place and it doesn't have that much history um, no. compared to But other it places did like have that. the class, but back then it had the class. Whereas yeah. I'm not saying it's unclassy now, but you, you couldn't see Bond going there now. But also no. the fact that he was like a kid, a 14 year old boy, he would have been heavily influenced or, you know, that the Hollywood thing would have seemed even more amazing yeah. to, to someone of that age. Then obviously an adult Bond going to LA, you just wouldn't do it, would you? It yeah. just wouldn't work. But within this setting, within this era and with that age Bond, I think it works really well. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. So let's talk about some of the characters. Now, the most important one, if you're going to write a Bond story, young or, or adult, is getting the character of Bond right so i guess not an I, easy thing i don't know an no. easy thing at all and i think like there's a careful balance you've got to strike isn't there that you know he, he's james bond so he's got to be reasonably heroic but he's only 14 so he can't overstep that mark of what you know a kid could potentially do but at the same time it's a story aimed at kids so he has to overstep that boundary to a degree Otherwise, it's probably going to be a pretty boring story. So there's a real yeah. tightrope that you've got to walk, I think, right and yeah. something like that. So I thought there was a couple of bits I wanted to read, basically, um, that were kind of just just hints at the character 
we know that he's going to become eventually. So, for example, there is page 22. I'm just going to quickly go to. I do like your reading voice, Tom, I must say. Thank you very I'm, much. I'm getting excited to listen to it already. Well, what, what can I say? I think <laughs> I think uh, Agent Golden voice, Mr. Simon Woolley, would probably outrank me on that. But, uh, but there we go. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, okay, so it's basically at the point where Bond has arrived at Dartington Hall um, and is only going to be a temporary stay and all that kind of stuff. So because his stay was so short, James saw no need to make any new relationships. He'd stayed cordial with classmates and found Hugo agreeable company, but had no real desire to make new friends. Friendship meant trust and trust could be betrayed. It was a lesson James had already learned the hard way. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It's kind of one of those things because like the adult Bond... Felix and Bill Tanner aside, doesn't really have a great deal of mates, does he? No. Well, I mean, look at his whole trust thing in Casino Royale. I know it's it's in a relationship sort of, you know, with Vesper, but there's still the underlying thing of trust, isn't there? Mm. Um, but yeah, no, like you said, um, Felix, he's kind of chummy with. Um, obviously, he's had a couple of allies where he's been mates with like Mark and Stracco, obviously Karen Bay and... and uh, Columbo they and always others. they always fall into that window of work related friends though don't they like yeah. he hasn't got any mates that he'd no. phone up and be like hey do you want to come around and watch the football yeah. or whatever you know although I guess you wouldn't see that in a Bond film if That's that was the true. case anyway <laughs> yeah, good point <laughs> um, but obviously who knows Spectre Bond 24 we mentioned the whole you know Franz Oberhauser and uh, and the link to Hans which could That's be a boy true. and child so that could be the first one so yeah, yeah absolutely That's be. a good point so maybe we, we tread a new ground with Spectre so there's that there's there's the thing of Bond at 14 years old he's already you know he's already got trust issues which I can imagine stems from you know the parents and being an orphan and all that kind of stuff so that kind of Nice. And his time at Eton as well. The other thing that actually made me laugh when I read it yeah. was uh, when Bond has something to eat. Now, obviously, <laughs> Fleming was very much, he'd like to spend a good couple of chapters describing, you know, what Bond was having for breakfast or whatever. Um, but there was this little section that is, which got my eye. James ordered a steak sandwich with eggs. The eggs proved less straightforward than he'd imagined. They offered, to, they, obviously he's in the States at this point. They were offered to him sunny side up, over easy, over medium, over well, hard or overcooked. Now what made me laugh, why that made me laugh is that exact same thing happened to me recently while Seriously? I was here. Seriously? And I hadn't got a fucking clue what any of them meant. So that didn't make me laugh. He chose what did you order? I think I went over easy just because that's a term I'd heard before, but I had no idea what it meant. And it, I, right. do you know what? I can't even remember how it was served up to me in the end, but anyway, yeah. um, probably our American listeners will be laughing right now. Um, he chose the first option because it was the only one he could remember and was somewhat disappointed to find that they were simply fried so that's the beginnings of bond scrambled eggs isn't it obviously yeah. he wanted scrambled eggs and he's not happy because they were served fried so yeah. again that's nice i'm liking that there's these yeah. this like to non-bond retard fans like us this conversation would probably sound like the most ridiculous thing ever <laughs> talking about what kind of eggs bond has as a kid but i feel like it's an important thing because the scrambled eggs and that you know the black coffee and the orange juice yeah. like is such a key thing that Bond would have for breakfast, yeah. and and there is there's the beginning of it. And do you know what I I love scrambled eggs, and I love that that that's a link that I've got to Bond. It's like yeah. my love for scrambled egg, as, yeah. as stupid and as silly and as minor as that is, it's that little link, and I'm like, wow, that's yeah. brilliant. So uh, another thing we have to mention though is if uh, anyone in North America um, can explain to us. What what the what you know what how those eggs are actually cooked in uh, yeah. in layman's terms? Obviously, sunny side up is fried. Uh, but if anyone knows the rest of them, if they could let us know, we'd be uh, most appreciated for the yeah. next time I I go to America, and obviously the next time you go out for breakfast. Yeah, so <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> sunny side up, which we know, over easy, no idea. Over medium, no idea. Over well, hard or overcooked. Like, they all sound, oh, <laughs> fuck knows, I don't know. But there we go. Um, anyway. So that was a funny little thing. Um, yeah. Now, the Bond girl of the piece is Boudica Price, otherwise known as Booty. Now, again, this is another dangerous thing, isn't it? In the sense that, like, you could, the Bond girl name is tricky because you could easily fall into a territory that sounded like a bit cliche or a bit rubbish. Yeah. But I think he's done well. I think that's a, like a, it's an exotic sounding name, yeah. but classically English at the same time, I think. I think, is it Budicha or Budicha or something like that? I, I think there was, because I, um, it mentions there was a sort of an ancient warrior called uh, Budacia. Is it Budacia? I think it's Bodicea. I've not. Oh, Bodicea. No, of course yeah. it is. It's Bodicea. No, that's yeah. what it is. Bodicea. 
and um, and I think that's kind of where you know there's sort of a little hint, but um, Bodice, of course, is. but yeah, no, I really like it, and and you know she gets a the sort of nickname Booty, and this you know she's a great character actually, a really really nice character, um, interesting. Um, obviously, you don't want, we don't want to give too much away, but it's uh, yeah, she's she's. She's uh, she's a couple of years older than Bond. She's like sixteen. Yeah. Bond's fourteen, so yeah. she's she's a little above his pay grade at this point. But uh, mm. it doesn't stop does him. He does he like it? the no? Does he like the older lady? I, I guess I guess he <laughs> might do. Yeah, uh, but uh, but there was there was an interesting part that happens. Uh, again, this doesn't really affect the story, but I think this might be Bond's first kiss. You know, yeah. Because Did he ever I, kiss? Um, in, I, he he was with that girl Roan or Rowan in. Um, by royal command, did he kiss her? I can't, I can't see. I can't remember. I can't remember whether he yeah. does or not. But I, I it, this struck me as I'm reading it. I was like, shit, is this is this the first kiss that we've seen? Yeah. But it's not referenced like that. So maybe he did kiss her in by royal command. I'm not yeah, sure. Maybe. But uh, but that's interesting. Anyone who's read that book recently, let us know. So basically, uh, Booty gives him a kiss right at, at one point, and uh, he says on the cheek, of course, which. You know, it's funny. Um, of course, says Booty. And Booty leaned in and kissed him softly on the mouth. Sorry, I missed, she says. So you did. James placed his hands on the small of her back and edged her closer. They kissed again beneath the stars and the Hollywood moon. So that's almost like something Bond would do, isn't it? It's almost like yeah. she's giving him a lesson, like in the sense that I can imagine Roger going, I'll give you a kiss on the duke, and then missing and, yeah. you know, forcing himself on her somewhat violently. <laughs> so that's almost like she's giving them a lesson in how to treat the ladies, don't you think? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, well, you can imagine that's him sort of, yeah, definitely in a few years' time. He's obviously logged it in his memory for later, hasn't he? Um, yeah, I'm going to use you know. that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Side note, actually, I remember when I was a kid, like when I was probably like seven or eight years old, I used to have a little system with Bond and the ladies, right? And believe it or not, when I was a kid at primary school, I was this crazy ladies man, right? I used to have so many girlfriends when I was like seven or eight. It was ridiculous, <laughs> right? Crazy, right? As soon as as soon as I reached an age that where like that would that would have been useful, it all fell apart, right? So so at that point where I didn't really know what I was supposed to do with girls, right? I had so many girlfriends, and what I would do is That's they would amazing. come over, to, they would come over to play, right? And then I would stick on a Bond at some point, and we'd be watching it. And then I would use that moment, like so. Whenever Bond would kiss a girl on screen, yeah, I'd just give her the little look, and then I that I'd use my mo- my moment to strike. So like, when I was like seven or eight, I'd be macking out on all these girls, and it was amazing. And then as soon as I reached the age where I could actually understood what I was actually meant to do with girls, it all fell apart, and it's just like I just had no skills whatsoever, which was which was. I'm awful. seeing you in a completely um, different light. <laughs> 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 little seven year old Tommy ladies man yeah absolutely yeah that was so I just, good oh, I just wow. wish it had carried on into my adult life yeah. but there you go did, did, did you, I could just imagine you sitting there with like a bevy of him like George <laughs> yeah. in uh, Majesty's <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh man oh, those, were days. Good. those were the yeah. days those were the days those were the days um so yeah, so moving on, some of the, the supporting cast of characters. We've got Hugo Grand, who is a dwarf. So Bond's little dwarf yeah. mate. Now this one, I feel like, I feel like there's some some definite man with a golden gun parallels with this movie, uh, with this book. Sorry, yeah, that's uh, quite a in, lot actually. In more ways than one, um, and this one, it's almost like he's almost taken some of the, the 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 familiar things with Bond that we know, and just sort of put a little twist on him and done him a little bit differently. So instead of it, you know the dwarf being the enemy, he's actually Bond's yeah. sort of sidekick and mate for this story, which is great because I think I feel like if you're if Steve Cole's job is to introduce kids. To bond like that's a great way of doing it isn't it taking yeah. something that's familiar and then when they progress onto watching the movies there's just like like a nice little link to that what do you, what do yeah. you think no i think it's brilliant um every you know every little link and every little subtle sort of reference to the movies as well as to the books i think is is superb um and i think it's it's kind of brave as well because you know if you're writing a book you kind of have to um take snippets of Fleming if you yeah. don't then what are you doing sort of thing yeah. but to also include sort of these references to to little bits in the films you know however subtle they may be I think is a great idea and and for me being I'm a huge obviously a huge fan of the films and 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 I loved it every single time that something came up I, I was like oh that's really yeah. good it's you know, nice, isn't it? yeah. you know he, he thought he was thinking about that and he and, and he did it well so yeah no Every, every little bit like that, I was just uh, 
got me that little bit more excited. Yeah, it? same here. Yeah. Uh, next up, we've got Gillian DeVries, which is basically she's the director of education at Darting. St. Hall and she basically is like their chaperone when they go up to the States so she's like the adult who's kind of there to look after the kids um, and she strikes me as the kind of the kind of woman that Bond would have probably boned had he been an adult do you know what I mean she's <laughs> this, like, would, this would have been the uh, you know you get your, your your classic three Bond girls you get the femme fatale who dies yeah. halfway through you get the main Bond girl at the end and then you get the one kind of near the start she would have been kind of like the one near the start that he, mm. that he had a bit of fun with and, yeah. uh, and then say goodbye to probably. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. She'd have been like a professor of foreign languages at Cambridge yeah. or something that he'd yeah, have been boning yeah. on the side completely. <laughs> um, you've got Dr. Tobias Lever, who is a great American philanthropist and experimental educationalist. And that's the kind of premise that gets them from the school in the UK to the school in America. Basically, all the kids are shipped across to like do studies and try all this sort of experimental education stuff. So he's like the link to the States. Um now, also what we've got is Mr. Anton Kostler, who's kind of a, an American movie mogul, kind of money man, kind of kind of guy who owns this huge studio and owns the Zeppelin and kind of basically bankrolls this experimental educational institute in the States. Um, you've got uh, George Barron, who's kind of like the head of security. Now, this guy kind of he strikes me as like the Bond henchman kind of type. Um, yeah. which uh, which Bond goes up against. Um, so let me just read a little segment out from this. Uh, it last. Okay, so this is George Barron. So he was in his mid-50s, perhaps, with grey, bushy hair. The eyes beneath the heavy lids were sharp hazel. The voice was deep, gravelly Midwestern. I'm George Barron, head of security. He held out a hand to be shaken. Welcome to All World Pictures. So he's kind of like the whole sort of description of him. He reminds me a little bit of Mr. Hinks, actually. He's got yeah. that same sort of stocky kind of... Uh, kind of vibe going on um and uh and he's kind of like you would imagine the adult bond going up against that character um pretty easily um now the other thing is is you've got kind of this kid martin costler who is the son of anton who's almost like another henchman but like one that's of equal footing to bond somewhat in in the same similar sort of age category within the young bond yeah exactly yeah. so it's kind of like you know bond at 14 years old isn't going to be able to take on you know, an adult kind of head of security kind of guy. So you've also got this character who Bond can sort of get involved with um, on a more even kill. So basically his description uh, goes as follows. He was tall and lithe with a shock of white blonde hair, muscles taut beneath his short sleeved shirt. High cheekbones accentuated his almost feminine beauty, dark eyes, a straight nose and full lips that looked painted onto his pale face. To James, he looked somehow more like a product than a person. Now, I think that is a really, really cool description because that like yeah. paints the picture in your mind immediately. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever been to LA, but you see people like that <laughs> all the fucking time. Like people in the supermarket who just have perfect hair and skin and face and there's just no blemishes or anything on their, on them at all. And they've yeah. got, you know, like they just look, they just look somewhat a little bit on the odd side because there's just, they yeah. don't look perhaps as normal fa as they fa could. Factory line perhaps. Exactly, you know, and it is yeah. the land of, plastic surgery and all that kind of stuff as well. So I th I feel like that's a, that's a perfect thing. And it almost reminds me of that kid in Harry Potter. You know, I've never seen the movies. Oh, Dra books, Draco Malfoy, is it? Him, yeah, yeah. That, that little yeah. nipper that you see is <laughs> the villain. Yeah. But yeah, that's so I, I feel like, you know, you, you know Bond's going to come up against a character like that and and uh, and you kind of sufficiently hate him enough uh, yeah. being a, a spoiled little brat, which is cool. Okay. Um, other characters, you've got Tori Woe, who's a, a reporter that kind of Bond crosses paths with. Um, now, one thing I thought some people might think about this is that there's a lot of kind of old school gangsters in this story, you know, dressed up in the, the fedora hats and all that kind of yeah. stuff. And one of the reviews I actually read was saying that some of those characters were a bit cliche, right? So, mm -hmm. And Tori Woe is another one. She's like a sort of hard hitting reporter who's sassy and all that kind of stuff. And I can kind of see where they're coming when they make a comment like that. However nobody did that more than Ian Fleming. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. when you read Live and Let Die, some of the characters in that are like, you couldn't be more sort of stereotypical. And, and the same with Diamonds Are Forever with those, the, the gangsters that appear in that. It's like, yeah. I don't see that as a problem because that's exactly yeah. what Fleming would have done. So exactly. it kind of matches up perfectly. And, and they were there around that time in that place. So, yeah. you know, they were, it's not, they're not just a figment of imagination that we've seen in movies nowadays portraying that it, yeah. it was based on reality so yeah, yeah. 
Absolutely. Um, so that kind of gives you the rundown of like the characters, the main kind of players. There are a few more, but those are kind of the main players in the in the whole story. Um, now, some other kind of supporting things which I thought were really cool um, is uh, is first of all, Bond gets his first gun in this, right? Now, in the sense that he's 14 years old, he's not going to be carrying a Walther PPK or a Beretta 25 even at this point. But what he does have is like a, a kind of a, a handcrafted BB gun, right? That fires ball bearings, which, you know, I don't know. Have you ever fired a BB gun before? I, I have, and I've been on the receiving end. Of it. <laughs> and they fucking hurt, don't they? They, they do, really right? do, yeah. yeah. Like, they, as, as silly as that sounds, to have Bond running around with a BB gun, like if you get, I, I, I've heard stories of people getting shot in the eye with one of those, and it's like yeah. blinded them and stuff like that. Oh. And man, they hurt. I've been shot with one myself. I remember one time there was back at uni, there was like four of us and uh, there were, we had two on two in the house and we had like little barricades, you know, like uh, camping mats at the top of the yeah. stairs with like, and we were all wearing sunglasses to protect our eyes and it was, yeah. it was awesome. That but it was like lethal. Fun, it was yeah. lethal. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's good, good stuff. I like that. But, uh, but yeah, so and again, this is another parallel to, to um, uh, Man with the Golden Gun in the sense that the, the kind of the, the pistol has been handcrafted and sort of put together from different bits and pieces. And it's like the stock is like just a lump of wood and there's like a spring-loaded mechanism that was hand-built and like a belt buckle that's used as a trigger. So immediately you think of the golden gun when you hear that. So there's a little um, uh, description of it here. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. The barrel assembly gleamed blue and black, as new, not a trace of rust or residue remaining. The belt buckle trigger had been properly weighted, its action firm but smooth, and the chunky stock he'd spent so long sanding had been stained and varnished. Carved carefully into the base of the stock in small discrete capitals was the word Queen's Marsh. So basically, I feel like not that this is mentioned, but you kind of get the sense that like this is a weapon Bond's going to keep throughout the next few books. Do you know what I mean? Um, and it's basically just like a really sort of high powered BB gun that he kind of uses throughout the story. And Queen's Marsh is like a, an area of, of the Dartington school that he kind of uh, visits and stuff like that. And I think that's a great name for it. It feels like something that would have come out of Fleming. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's great. It's almost like... I like the fact it's been given a name as well. Obviously, a general BB gun wouldn't have a name, would it? But the fact it's got its name, it almost makes it personalised, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and it's it's you know you know Bond's going to take care of it, and uh, and it, it, it's something that again it, it's it's a precursor to to later years with with you know when he gets into real firearm territory, and the fact that he's learning. Okay, it's not a real gun, but even just playing around and practicing with that you know that that's the start of him getting his sharp shooting skills isn't it really? yeah absolutely yeah. yeah i think it's it's really good and again the, the parallel with the golden gun as well i think is really great it's another one yeah. of those like the whole yeah. dwarf with knickknack and all that kind yeah. of stuff it's just sort of flipped on its head and bond's got that now instead of scaramanga which is yeah. which is really cool um and then just some other things that kind of like have honorable mentions um which is uh obviously more glimpses into the kind of the, the luxurious world that bond would kind of occupy later on in his life um there's a car uh sequence in it which uh is a Hillman Minx, which I looked up, and it's like a classic looking gangster car with like the yeah. sideboards that run down and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is which is really good. And I I basically looked the, the car up and it said uh in one of the um the kind of advertising posters, it said the Hillman Minx is generally accepted as the finest example of scientific light car construction providing big car performance. We recommend it to discerning motorists who demand the most ingenious combination of luxury, comfort, power, performance, and economy. So that again sounds like something Fleming would have been into, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. And it suit and it suits again. Obviously, it suits a period, but you want something that stands out, don't you? You want yeah. You want something with a bit of meat to it as well, a bit of beef. You know, it's going to uh, it's going to help you out or get you somewhere. Completely. To. Yeah. And I mean, and when you look at the the cars Fleming had Bond driving in the early books, it was like it, they were those kind of cars. That Bentley yeah. that he had in, in yeah. uh, Casino Royale was like one of those real old school, massive yeah. looking tank things with no. You'd have had to wear goggles and all that kind yeah, of stuff to it. drive it, and all those kind of things. The which is Villiers engines blasting yeah, away and yeah, stuff. Completely. Yeah, completely. Um, cool. Now, uh, just to kind of finish up our thoughts on the book. Um, there's a, a a moment that happened that again made me smile straight away and kind of brought up a memory I had of, of one of the other Fleming stories. Um, now, basically, there's a character that they think they might have seen somewhere else, basically, and Hugo says uh, he might have just been dining at the restaurant, you know, happenstance. And I was like, happenstance. 
I'm sure I've heard that phrase somewhere before and then look it up and obviously it's a quote from Goldfinger. Famous quote where Goldfinger says, once is happenstance, twice is coincidence, three times is enemy action. So again, great detail. Yeah. Cole knows what he's doing. Like it. Yeah, I love I love it. I love, love everything like that. And yeah. it's, it's, you know, to like you said, to your casual reader, you might not know it, but oh, I don't know. You, you're catering for all audience all sort yeah. of ranges, aren't you? I mean, your uh, average I mean, stuff like that. That your average is, kid who's reading this book isn't going to get that link. So that stuff is in there for people like us, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Not saying that you can't get ge- kids that aren't as geeky Bond fans as as us, us and our JBR listeners, because I'm sure they're. In fact, we've had we've heard from quite a few of them who have been pretty young. And, Indeed. Uh, and I'm sure they'd know stuff like that as well. So. Completely. Um, there's also a nice little Hoagie Carmichael reference in there as well. Yeah. Obviously, Fleming said that's who he thought Bond would have looked like in his in his imagination. Um, nice. And there's a little glimpse into the world of gadgets. Um, there's a there's a, a mention of a of a miniature camera called a Photofex Minifex, um, which was uh, produced in Berlin between 1931 and 1935, like a little tiny miniature camera. Um, that still produced like full on full quality images and that there's a, a sequence involving that as well so it's kind of like he's covered all the bases he's got he's yeah. got a weapon it's kind of like the equivalent of you know Bond trading up to the wolf PPK uh, he's got a car sequence uh, he's got you know a little gadget in there as well so it is almost like yeah. you know young Bond becoming Bond in it you know yeah. it's all those little hints which I think is great which is much better to do this way than the James Bond Jr. animation equivalent. Is yeah. Much better this way. You don't want some kid who's like works for a spy agency and all that kind of stuff. That would have been a disaster had that happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I love the way he's done it. So what what's your overall thoughts about the whole story then? So overall thoughts are um, it was it was a really, really, really enjoyable read. I thought it was great. I like the way it's segmented. So you've got this is Bond in England. You've got this is Bond on the Zeppelin, on the Air Blimp. This is Bond in LA. Um, I think, it, I, I do have to admit, I think it was gorier than I thought it was going to be. So so compared to previous uh, young Bonds, I do think this this is a little bit more uh, sort of hard hitting in certain in certain ways. And not necessarily, that's not necessarily a bad thing by any means, um, but, it, but it is quite gory. But I think there's some lovely characters in there, some, some really good twists. And, and a lot of really cool references to both the books and the films. Uh, yeah. And and like the end, obviously we can't say anything to, about the end, but there's a couple of sequences towards the end and it, they're really so tense and you you can picture it so well and, and you're right on the scene. And uh, yeah, I think he does a bang up job. Um, I, after reading it now, I think he's, he's more than capable as a predecessor. Uh, to, um, a successor a su- successor I should say sorry to the predecessor Hickson yeah. Um, yeah so I can't wait to read the next one good job good job yeah Steve. me too I think the way this one's left as well it's like when you read that last page you're like man I'm excited for the next one now yeah yeah, yeah. it's good it's, I mean, it's, I think, like, it's like the end of Skyfall isn't it yeah absolutely yeah 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 exactly you're just, yeah, yeah, you're yeah, just yeah. pumped for the next one and, yeah. and it's you know you've got to completely wait for it now, but. so I, I think like when you if you're a fan of the Hickson books, again, like we all would be, you're like, oh, is the new guy going to be any good kind of thing? You have that kind of feeling. And there's a definite sort of like difference in style of writing without yeah. a doubt. But, no, at the same, but at the same time, it's like it definitely feels of the time it's set in and it, it feels like it does carry on from by, by Royal Command and it does it feels like that character still. You know what I mean? It's not like a yeah. jarring difference. It's like... No. It's it's carrying on and 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 sort of taking it to, to to new places, which I think is really good. And I think the descriptions he uses are really really strong. Visually, the descriptions are great. Very Fleming esque, I thought. Yeah. In the way that he handles certain things. Um, so yeah, I, th- I think every, I mean I'm I'm pretty sure everyone would would uh, really enjoy it. I think it was great, great. Read. Absolutely. So if you haven't read Shoot to Kill yet, grab yourself a copy and get involved. If you haven't read the the Higson books yet. You can uh, you can absolutely start with shoot to kill. Um, there'd be no problem with that. Um, you're, you're sort of like not. There's nothing too important that you're going to miss to start off with shoot to kill. Um, likewise, 
you would be equally as good starting off with Silverfin and going through in sequence as well. So uh, if you haven't explored Young Bond, do it because it's bloody great and I really like yeah. it. And there's some of like there's some of my favourite of the continuation of authors uh, is the uh, is the Young Bond book. So Definitely. well done, Steve. And- yeah, I'm. I'm just excited to know about the next one now. I'm trying to picture where he might be or what he's going he to be. He was crazy, wouldn't he? To, he? He well, obviously he's going to be like he wasn't going to let on. Um, but it, it's nice because it makes you think. Oh, it makes you sort of have ideas of what could possibly be the next one. And yeah, uh, yeah. No, I, I'm looking forward to. It. Obviously, he doesn't know. Like you said, he doesn't know when the ne- when it, the release date for the second one. It could be yeah. the end of this year. It could be next year. I think he was hoping for the towards the yeah. end of this year. Um, Absolutely. But we'll see. We'll see. So yeah. Okay, so it's time for some Bond facts, or should we call them cold facts? Cold facts, flames, explosion, fire, cold facts. Okay, (laughs) sorry about that, Steve, if you're listening. Right, okay, so I found a few few, uh, cold facts for today. Uh, Cold fact number one. Steve Cole attended the University of East Anglia from 1989 until 1992, where he read English literature and film studies, which is pretty uh, a good thing for what he's doing now. Yeah. He graduated from his BA course with first class honours. So, uh, Very nice. So nice. Uh, Steve Cole, fact number two. Uh, this is a really interesting one, actually. Steve is a hugely prolific writer, having written 23 Astrosaurs novels, eight Astrosaurs Academy novels, 12 Cows in Action novels, 12 Doctor Who novels, 8 Slime Squad novels, 3 Z Hunting novels, 3 Jonah Wish novels, 3 Whaling novels, and to date 2 Tripwire novels, and that's in addition to numerous other works, plays and tie-ins and co-writing that he's done with a load of other books. Like, that is... is I, I just can't imagine the amount of time that's like... Const- you no wonder you know he's pushed for time because if you think he's right he's writing that much um but he's doing book tours as well yeah. and promotion as well i mean he i wonder if that guy ever sleeps <laughs> so, yeah absolutely that's, that's a lot of books in it yeah it's funny because stuff if you look at his website he obviously does a lot of writing for like way younger kids like yeah. really yeah. young kids as well um and uh and there's i think i remember reading that he's done a couple of adult novels as well under the name stephen cole so they're worth uh, looking into as well yeah but uh but yeah good on him that's a lot of work and uh okay so cole fact number three um in addition to writing his own novels steve also was also an editor of fiction and non-fiction for various publishers so not only does he write but he edits as well i think now he's kind of Less on the editing, obviously, more doing his own stuff, but, you know, yeah. multi-talented guy. Uh, Cole, fact number four. Now, this is kind of related to what we have heard previously in the podcast, but Steve described the 14-year-old James Bond in Shoot to Kill as a decisive, proactive alpha male, but not a superhero and not yet the self-sufficient killer he'll grow up to become. So, you know, obviously... He, he he was layering some um, sort of uh, characteristics there that lead him on to what we sort of know and love. Um, Very so nice. There we are. Cool I think he did a bang up job about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So moving on then, we've got our guess. No, we haven't. Leading no, on, sure. we've got our <laughs> Bond trivia round. Trivia. So I think you might know the answer to my question that I posed at the beginning. Um, and uh, but this is one I didn't know about until okay. I, I read it myself. So my question of the day was: yes. Which Bond girl from You Only Live Twice also appears in another Bond film as a different character? And what was that other Bond film? Right now, the only one that I can think of, which I think it might be, was uh, in You Only Live Twice. There was a character in the pre-title sequence. It's called Ling who mm-hmm. uh, happened to be in bed with James Bond, who was also, several years later, um, in, she happened to be in a Casino Royale around one of the casino tables. Um, and I think the actress's name is Sai Lin? No, uh, yeah, Sai Ch- Chin. Well, once again, you have absolutely blown me out of the water with your superior Bond knowledge. It's absolutely right. Her name is Sai Chin. Sai Chin. But... Lynn, you think we better, huh? I give you very best duck. <laughs> is sitting around the card table in Casino Royale, and I never knew that. Isn't that incredible? But, ha- but how crazy is that? So we're talking 67, uh, what was Casino Royale? 2006. 2006. I mean, that's awesome, isn't it? How yeah. cool is that? Um, yeah. But I think that's great as well, because, you know, it's a Bond family going back, and it's a nice little link, and yeah, stuff like that's awesome. 
Damn right. Before. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Well done. I'm, okay, I'm, so I'm impressed you got that. You. Well, I didn't initially, though. It took me a little while because I went through Kissy and, you know, Aki and Helga Brands. And I was like, oh, there's got to be someone else. But no, really good question, though. Top question. So on um, to my Bond trivia question, which was, in which of the young James Bond novels did James Bond join the Danger Society? I think that is my personal favourite of the Higgsons, which is Blood Fever. <sighs> Yes, you got it right. Nice. <laughs> well done. Yeah, right. it is Blood Fever. So in Silverfin, obviously, uh, he hasn't heard about the Danger Society, or if he has, he hasn't joined it. But Blood Fever is the one where where he becomes part of that gang. And, and you get that really cool bit at the start of Blood Fever where they're all running across rooftops and oh, stuff like that, aren't they? Man, I love that. that is, I fucking love that sequence. Yeah. I re- like, I, I love that where he sneaks out of his room and he's sneaking yeah. across the rooftops, man. Oh, that is it's right cool, on my street. It? I love yeah, that. It, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant stuff. So, yeah, excellent. Well done. Double, Good stuff. Uh, double bonus for trivia this week. Okay. So, next up, we have Bond, 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 Bond. James Bond. There it is. The guess the quote <laughs> round. So, it was, uh, it. It was my turn last time, so I'm going to. Right. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to rack out my again. performance again. Okay, yeah, I'm just I love it. Get, That's good. Get myself go into uh, into into <clears> into quote mode. mode. <clears throat> I'm a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> like that is that that is a pitch perfect. That is Thank pitch you. perfect. Can I <laughs> listen to it one more time? Of course, I do like it. All right, here we go. Okay. I'm a bomb. i love it i love it it's so good okay now i won't be able to give you a character name okay because i don't know if he has one but basically i I think i mean obviously we reviewed live and let die last time i believe this is one of the guys in the voodoo ceremony who after bond shoots uh dambala he tries to get bond with uh i think he's got a machete and then bond and he goes, oh, hello. and then Bond shoots him, and then he's flawed. You're, you, I'm going to give it to you, but you're almost almost there. It is Dan Barlow who says it. Basically, what he is does, it? he's got oh. the snake, and he's about to yeah. get, make it bite Jane Seymour, and yeah. then he stops at the last second, turns around, puts the snake in the air, and goes, Abbeball! And then all, oh. all of the watchers get on their knees, and they all say, Abbeball, Abbeball, and all that kind of stuff. So there well, it is. Well, I'll get there. a half mark then, because for some reason I thought it was a guy who ran at him with a machete, but I, I'll get a half mark, I think. I don't think I should get a deserved okay. full mark. All right. for that, well, half, yeah, half mark. Live and let die, though. There you go. There cool. you go. Very nice. nice. You got it. Okay, so. <coughs> is that my your quote? New quote. <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah. No, my new quote I'm not going to do Descendant Hip, and I'm not going to do Teehee's Laugh again. So okay. my new quote is <coughs> You ready for this? Mm hmm. My new quote for this podcast is, but that means I would have to be. Oh, that's got me. Yeah, one more time. Yeah, yeah, let's have it. Here we go. But that means I would have to be. Oh, you know what you've done? You've given me one of those that I know I know somewhere and it's going to jump into my head at some point this week. Yeah. Okay. I know so I'm going to get. I think I'm going to get that. But I, yeah, I don't I think, know. It yet. I think. I think you are. Shall I do one more? Or are you all right? You're yeah. All right. Go on. Let's have it one all more. All right. Very, very last one. Here we go. I'll try and get a bit better. <clears throat> okay. Here we go. But that means I would have to be. All right. Good work. Excellent. Okay. Work. That's a good one. That's okay. gonna be, I like the ones that get me thinking, and you've got give yeah. me one that's got me thinking there. That's when you know stuff. it's in there, but it's just yeah. kind of yeah. Absolutely. So in terms of our listener quotes we've had recently, uh, yeah. we had one from Dave Rolf last time, uh, which was this one. You were saying something about the lost art of interrogation? And we answered last time that it was Defence Minister Dimitri Mishkin, Defence Minister in GoldenEye. Yeah. Um, and he graciously emailed in afterwards to confirm that we had got that correct. So if anyone was wondering from last time, uh, it was uh, Dimitri Mishkin. Um, Congrats to anyone that got it. Absolutely. And then also we had a message from uh, Jeff Silence last time uh, who uh, left us a nice quote. So I'm going to play that for you again now. Here it is. And I'm Dick Tracy and you're still under arrest. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So what, what I think we both know this one, don't we? 
Yeah, I mean, go on, you, you take it. What, so, it? <laughs> thank you. So it was like the police chief dude at the end of A View to a Kill, uh, yeah. which again is another one of those funny ones, isn't it? Because he says, my name is Bond, James Bond or whatever. And he's like, yeah, I'm Dick Tracy. So it implies yeah. that James Bond is a famous person that he would have known. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But even to a common police officer, it's like, yeah. I mean, it was bad enough when um, Tiffany Case knew it in Diamonds, like, because obviously, even though she's a diamond smuggler as such, and she might have heard of secret agents, she wouldn't know what Bond was if he was secret agent. Yeah. But I mean, that's bad enough. But the fact that some dodgy San Francisco police officer knows his name, that's, uh, I, I, yeah, that's one bit I'd definitely ed out. when With the Bond films... I'd love to do a re-edit of some of them. And if I had a view to kill, that's one bit I'd definitely remove. But um, but still, go. it's a good, good, good quote. So Jeff got back in touch uh, to let us know the answer. So we're just going to play that for you now. Hey, guys. Jeff Silence back with my answer to the guess the quote. It was probably a little too easy for you guys. So if you guessed the San Francisco police captain from a view to a kill, you're right. I was in San Francisco on vacation, and I was on McAllister Street in front of the city hall where they filmed that scene, but obviously I couldn't record there because McAllister is actually a pretty busy street. But if you're ever in San Francisco, stop by the city hall there. It's actually a pretty beautiful building. Anyway, I thought if that was too easy for everyone, then I have some Bond trivia that should hopefully be a little bit more demanding. Now, in Octopussy, Kamal Khan and Orlov plot to set off a nuclear bomb at a U.S. Air Force base in Feldstadt, Germany, which I should also point out is a fictitious town and air base. The only Feldstadt that I can find in Germany is a small district in the city of Schweren, which would back then have been in East Germany. But anyway, what I want to know is the name of the Air Force wing that is stationed at Feldstadt where the bomb is supposed to go off. So it will be a number and a name, like, for example, the 101st Airborne. So what is the number and the name of the U.S. Air Force wing that is stationed at Feldstadt? Good luck. Okay, so a nice little bonus trivia question from Jeff yeah. there. Have you got, you're, you're the octopusy man, so have you got any idea yeah, about that? I've got, I've got something there, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I've definitely... Oh, it's. It's it's the same with you with the quote I just did. It's sort of I can almost picture it, but not quite. Oh, yeah. right. it's it's a toughie though, it, without a doubt. It's a toughie. So good question, cool. Jeff. Great question. All right. Good stuff. Okay, so Jeff, if you wouldn't mind leaving us another message with the answer to that, so we can play it next time, uh, that would be really good. And as a call out to all our other listeners, if you uh, want to leave us a uh, a guess the quote as well. Uh, go over to jamesbondradio.com and uh, click the button on the right hand side of the page to leave us a voicemail, um, and uh, and we'll probably play your Definitely. your performance on the show. So very I, good. I think w- what I'd like to hear is I th- I, th- I mean we got we got a few listeners now. It'd be nice to to get a couple of quotes from someone that's never never sort of messaged us before, never written in, never done anything, but. It's just sitting at home, listening to this, thinking, well, hang on a minute, I could do this one really well. That's what we want to hear is anyone that's sitting out there that can do a quote. It doesn't even have to be well. I mean, look at what me and Tom do. But, you know, if anyone wants to put in a quote. What do you mean? Great. (laughs) I'm only joking. (laughs) Um, But no, it'd be great to listen to you. So, yeah, yeah. Send send them in. Send them in. Absolutely. Any lurkers, any lurkers who've been listening for a while but have never got involved, get involved. Send us some quotage. uh, It'll be good to hear from you. Okay, so next up we have the guest music cue round, where we guess the music cue, if you haven't already (laughs) picked that up. (laughs) So we had a little one last time, which I think was probably the most glaringly obvious one we've ever done. Um, It was, yeah. Should we have a listen? Let's have a listen to it now. So here it is. This was last week's guest the music cue. There we go. So that do you know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of Psycho, sure. doesn't it? It does it's a bit, doesn't thing. it? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's that sort of high beat sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure every single person who listened to that got it. Um, and can you let us know what it is, Tom? That is the Bond versus Spider sequence in Doctor No. Yeah, a great scene that as well. And the yeah. high upbeat music. I mean, 
it's it's nice just to just to chuck a couple in there where people go, oh yes, I know that one. But you know, it's, yeah. it's a good one. It's a good one. So uh, okay, so obviously we've got a new uh, guest music cue for this week, and here it is. Okay. Okay. So again, as per usual, I I'm no good at these ones. I'm rubbish at them. Um, but I I my gut feeling tells me it's a bit of David Arnold going on there. Well, you might possibly be right. That's all I'm going to say on the matter. He's not giving anything away this week. He's not giving me any clues. But there we go. So, uh, so yeah. So if you if you got a if you know what that sequence is, let us know on the Facebook or the Twitter or whatever. Um, It'll uh, be good to hear from you and see if you've got it right. Okay. So next up, we have our new segment called the complete the lyric section which is basically where you we give you some Bond lyrics and you've got to put it together with the uh, with the song it's from, um, preferably giving us the, the following line that comes immediately after the, uh, the lyric quote. Now, eminent JBR listener Simon Woolley, also known as Agent Golden Voice, has taken it upon himself to create a theme tune for this section because we didn't have one last week. So he's uh, he's put one together for us, um, which is uh, which is uh, can be described as somewhat bombastic, wouldn't you say? I, I certainly like the sound of it, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So here is Agent Golden Voice with the Complete the Lyric Section theme tune. <laughs> Complete the Lyric Section! Agent Golden Voice means... Complete the lyric section. So there we go. How about that? I think I think that was uh, he put a lot of effort into that, and uh, yeah, it's only he good. He certainly uh, did. Yeah. I think he's got a career in like a Swedish dark metal band in, on the couch somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I think I think he'd be good at that. <laughs> good stuff. Yeah. So let's hear it then. So you gave us, a, okay. I guess, the uh, That's lyric it, round yes. last time, didn't you? So the very first complete the lyric uh, one from last time was. Are we singing or are we just saying? Because well, last you can, time you can sing if yeah. you like, man. I, I well, thought what well, you brought out last time was sensational. See, I, I tried to to you know throw you a bit by singing the lyric, but within the tune of another song. <laughs> yeah. So here we go. Okay, the lyric is set my hopes up way too high. Shall I actually do it properly? <laughs> no. Do you know what? That was almost half of the other song and half of I what know. it actually is. I know. <laughs> you're, you're really good at this, man. This is really interesting. I try to make it as hard as possible. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. So, set my hopes up way too high. Living's in the way we die. Yeah, baby. Excellent stuff. There it is. <laughs> now... When you sang that last time, you sang Set yeah. Your Hopes Up Way Too High, right? Which is what I've been singing since 1987, right? <laughs> and then one of our listeners, whose name escapes me right now, I apologise, said it's actually not Set Your Hopes Up, it's Set My Hopes set Up. My and you know what? I had a moment where I was like, oh, look, it's definitely set, set Your Hopes Up. And then when I checked it, it was Set My Hopes Up. And I've been singing so, the wrong lyric for the last... Okay. If that had been the million pound question on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire... Yeah. What is the lyric of Living Daylights? I would have said yeah. I'd have bet a million pounds on the que- on the question that it was set your hopes up, but it's not. Yeah. Well, this is why we need our JBR listeners to help us out and uh, you know bring us bring us up to date and correct yeah. us and stuff. So, have you got one for me this week? I do. My one okay. goes like this, and I'm going to deadpan it, right? Because okay. I don't think I can do it to a different theme. I'll just end up really? seeing what it is. So and I'm going to deadpan easy. it. Okay. And then when I give you the answer next time, I might brack out a full performance for you. All right, let's go for it. In my time, I've said these words before, but now I realise. I will repeat that for you. Yeah. In my time, I've said these words before, but now I realise. What Bond song is that from? Ooh. At, and well, you, we have to complete the line, don't we? It's not the Bond song. The line. Yeah, you've got to complete the line, which yeah. uh, which I'm going to have to have a think about. That's good. It's hard. I, I think what we should do in that case is for all future complete the lyric. When you first hear it, it's deadpan, 
And then when we have to play it again on the day, then we can yeah. sing it in, in however badly. <laughs> Whichever or, or, manner you <laughs> choose. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Okay, yeah, good one. Really good one. Very really good, good stuff. Question, no. And again, cool. uh, thanks to Simon Woolley for providing the theme tune there. That was uh, yeah. that was very good and entertaining. And uh, I love the fact that it's a bit Majesty's based as well. That's good. It's yeah. always good. Okay, so that about wraps up episode 31 of James Bond Radio. So next time we're keeping our next episode a little bit of a secret. We're going to re- give you a little hint uh, next Friday on Facebook and Twitter of what we're going to be talking about. Um, so make sure you come and join us there so you can uh, get a little uh, get a little insight into what's coming up next on James Bond Radio. Are you, are you excited about the next one? I'm very much excited. We've We've done episodes on a similar kind of subject before and they've proven yeah. to be very popular. So it's 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 going to be a good one I'm, I'm i'm thoroughly looking forward to it and we've got some material that will be very interesting to support said topic as well <laughs> yeah it's a very cryptic way Hint, of getting wink. Across. yeah like indeed <laughs> so stuff until next time i've been tom sears i've been chris wright and james bond radio will return with a mystery subject in two weeks time thank you very much we'll see you then take care thanks for listening see you guys Bye. Bye. <laughs> cool. That was good. Nice. Boomtown. <laughs>